A brief introduction. Uh, Computer History, History Museum is pleased to provide uh, this interview of Mike Warner, who will discuss his computer technology experiences. Uh, Al Shugart, an icon of our industry, uh, described Mike's development of the low mass slider as one of the four great development uh, items in uh, computer history, disk drive history. Um, today we'll hear from the person who actually did that, and uh, Mike was the key person in the development of that technology. Uh, Mike's roles included uh, engineer, manager, VP, president, and founder of a company. Uh, after his distinguished career in disk drives, uh, Mike went on to contribute to the development of small-scale uh, electronics, chip-scale packaging, and uh, enabling uh, ever smaller devices and uh, uh, shrinking sizes. In addition to technical prowess, uh, Mike was the natural leader, uh, was one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. And uh, I've worked with him at five different companies over a four-year period, and it's always been a pleasure. So with that, let's start uh, uh, the questions. Uh, first of all, Mike, we're interested, in, of course, in the technology that you uh, helped develop. But maybe give us a little background of your uh, family. And uh, you started out in Oregon and Washington and wound up in Southern California, and then a first job at IBM. So maybe some early history. Uh, sure. I, I was born in Spokane, Washington. And uh, shortly afterwards, my, my parents uh, moved to, uh, uh, to Oregon and uh, into a place called Warrington and Hammond and Astoria, which are at the mouth of the Columbia River. And my dad worked for, initially for the Army. And uh, he had been in the Army, but he worked as, uh, as the chief engineer on their, uh, one of their, their forts. Uh, and then uh, I grew up in Astoria. My dad had a, a business doing uh, refrigeration and air conditioning. And I grew up with tools in my hand. And it's, my earliest memories are shining the flashlight for my dad and running to the truck and getting tools. So I, that was kind of my world. I also, when I was a tiny kid, I hit, had a, 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 there's an abandoned car across the street from us. We lived on a small farm. And so I got to play in it and take it apart. So I got interested in, in mechanical things uh, very early on. Uh, in my, my mother had rheumatoid arthritis, and so in my senior year, or at the end of my junior year, our family moved to Southern California, actually to, um, to Redlands, uh, San Bernardino uh, area. And uh, I had been dating uh, Lori, nephew, uh, and we wrote back and forth for a year. and. Uh, and then after she graduated, she came down and went to school in, uh, uh, with me in, in San Bernardino Valley College. A year later, we got married, and uh, a little while later, we moved to, to uh, uh, San Jose, and I went to San Jose State. Uh, we both finished up there. And my first job, I, I worked for a number of places like Thermotest Laboratories and testing and, and general technical until I graduated, and then I worked, got a job at, at IBM. And it was one of two offers I had, GE and IBM. And fortunately, I chose GE because, I mean, uh, IBM, because GE was working in nuclear world, and that was not going to be nearly as, as interesting as uh, disk drive world. And they closed that down. Yes, they, they've, uh, they've closed that, so it is no more. Uh, I went to work in, in, uh, in uh, quality assurance, which was not what I had. I wanted to be uh, a design engineer, and, uh, uh, but I, I uh, found that quality assurance taught me a lot of good lessons. Uh, I joined what was called a 2311 uh, hid disk uh, line and worked on the, primarily on the disk line. And I learned the value of, of process control I don't know if you remember, Bill, but we used a Western Electric handbook and did X-bar and R charts and means and standard de deviations and had yield meetings and did all the stuff to, you know, for quality support. Now, the 2311 uh, actual product, a head product, was very manual. I mean, there were rows and rows and rows of ladies uh, 
sitting in front of microscopes with doing various uh, jobs. And the product itself, the 2311, was a, was a stainless steel slider uh, about a, uh, a nickel size. And it, had t it was curved with two holes in the air bearing, and it had uh, laminated cores that were ball staked into the, into the ceramic slider. And it... Uh, the metal slider. In, into, the, into the metal slider. Uh, the, uh, at that time, we did yields by the operators filled out how many they did and how many were good and bad, and the QA inspectors filled that out, and then the engineers would go up over that and we'd send it in to be, to be uh, entered into a, a database. So it was all manual. We got a computer report back, but all the, the entry and all the, all the numbers were generated by, by hand. And that was, uh, I remember going there and meeting, uh, you know, the first manufacturing ma manager, Des Owens, and his technician, uh, uh, Don Smith. And they were very welcoming. Uh, it turns out that Des was being a manufacturing manager, but he was educated in finance. But IBM took everybody they could. They were trying to hire people at that time uh, to fill up their, fat, their plant on, on Cottle Road. So it, it was, uh, uh, I, I would say, um, I walked away from that with an appreciation of, one, that the engineers have to learn how to properly spec things because the operator in the line looks at a, at a piece or what she's done and makes a judgment. And if she's too critical, you're throwing lots of good product away. If she's too lax, you're creating problems downstream. Sure. So it, uh, um, that was one lesson. The other was to have, wherever you can, have processes that you can actually measure and control. If you can't, and visual inspections are notoriously unreliable. So that, those early, that early lesson uh, actually was very powerful in my design decisions as I went on as, a, as, a, as an engineer. I think I was quite fortunate to, to join the quality organization. I know we made the discs at IBM, uh, but the heads were provided by outside firms? No, this, this, the headline was, was completely within IBM. We, we got photo etched uh, new metal, and we, we uh, lamp coated it with resin, laminated it, pressed it together, uh, wound our own coils, uh, put them on the, on the uh, new metal. Actually, we would do is bend the the, the stack, slide the coil over, and then bend it back. Now it turns out when you have these sharp edges that we would cut the coil sometimes. So that, that's where I met Carl Elser, who I later, and he came from Germany, and they had had the problem, and what they found is a little plastic tube that they could slide over the, uh, the core uh, and, and put the coil on it, and that uh, dramatically improved the yield for that particular uh, problem. You can see sliding a coil down a very sharp edge, you're bound to nick it. And, the, and by putting the tube on first, then you, you fix that. I, anyway, so the, uh, uh, one of my early jobs is also uh, heading the yield committee. And we had uh, a second level manager, Stan Disbro, and they called him the Silver Fox. And he would come in, and he was very, I mean, he was on everybody's case on our case, on the manufacturing guy's case, everybody's case, because he was ultimately responsible to get the numbers out and get the, uh, and, and meet, meet the commitments for the, for the headline. So it, it was a, a fun time and, uh, and interesting and my first experience in, inside of a, a really large corporation. Yeah, it's good, good training. Yeah. I remember I, I was hired by John Del Favreau. I don't know if you remember him. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. And yeah. he used to have the equivalent of yield meetings when we had problems. And it seemed like every summer the disk line would have problems. Yeah. <laughs> well, before you get to the IBM stuff, what got you interested in technology? You, you graduated, as I recall, as a mechanical engineer. Yes. And uh, did you have a technical career in mind when you were? Well, I decided, actually, when I was a freshman in high school, we had a, 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 a class that, uh, that was kind of prepare us, taught us how to study, to, you know, take notes, and also we, we worked on what, we, what did we want to do, you know, what vocation. 
And I decided then I wanted to be a mechanical engineer. And, and that's always been in my, in my mind, except for a short time in college when I wondered if I wanted to be a, a psychologist. But, <clears throat> but I took an aptitude test and says, I'm a better engineer than a psychologist. <laughs> I did the same thing. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I just threw one of those aptitude things. <laughs> so, I was not going to be a minister, that was for sure. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, the, the, uh, the I, I, IBM had really a, a lot of, uh, of, you mentioned about some people. Let me tell you about that first group. There were, there were guys in my QA group, like Cyril Glushkoff and, and Wayne Pierce. There's the manufacturing manager, uh, 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 Mike Peterson. Uh, I think Eric Solis was actually the, 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 uh, the guy on the, on the other side. It's also, I think, about the time I met you, uh, even though you, you, the 2311 was in production for you, just like it was for me, I think we got closer when we worked on the 2314. And uh, uh, I, I think I mentioned most of the other names of the, of the people that I recall off the top of my head. So uh, as the next product that was coming down the line was part of the System 360, and that was going to be the 2314 program. And the 2314 program was another, was another uh, program with, uh, or it was a program with disk packs. And disk packs were great because, in theory, you could have infinite storage by, uh, by having, swapping out disk packs. Now, that's the good part. The, the bad part was that when you swapped out disk packs, then uh, every head had to be able to read every, other, every disk pack. And if, you, if one head was, uh, uh, was contaminated, then you contaminated every pack. And sometimes one would be damaged, so you put a pack in and it would crash the, the surface. Then you put another pack in and it would crash the surface and so forth until you figured out, oh, the reason I'm not getting any data is because I have a, a, a bad hit on, the, on my drive. A anyway, and the, and the other one that's probably uh, even more important from a design standpoint was the, uh, all of the tolerances that were involved as you move from pack to pack. You had spindle tolerances and disk tolerances and thermal uh, things and so forth. So these early heads were done with a, with a, uh, a write wide, read narrow, or at least they had a tunnel erase, which means that they would erase either side of the track. So when you tried to position the head, if it was misregistered, it didn't try to read adjacent track information, it would just read its own, its own track information. So you would, you would uh, trim the tracks. And that allowed them to, to use things like hydraulic actuators and stops. So the, 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 they'd move to a position and mechanically detent it or stop it and read the tracks. Well, the 2314 was just a, uh, a higher density version. It, it had, instead of uh, two disc packs, it had seven disc packs. And taller. And it was taller, it was bigger, it was faster, it was everything. And also, from a head standpoint, we changed from the, the stainless steel curve slider to a round ceramic uh, slider, what we call the monkey face. It was white alumina. And instead of using uh, new metal laminated cores, we used a ferrite core. And uh, that turns out to be a significant change. Uh, it used also an, a new metal erase core on either side so that we'd, we'd trim the tracks. So we still had the advantage of, of trimming. But it was, again, it was a very manual process. It was done with, with you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of ladies under microscopes uh, assembling things. And uh, technically, it had one fatal flaw as far as the heads were concerned. And that is the core was bond, the cores were bonded to the, uh, alumina slider with epoxy. Now the epoxy would, when the, when the weather was humid, the epoxy would swell. When it dried out, it would move. And with temperature, it would move. And so it, it was just a terrible, uh, because you'd have a, a good head one day and a bad head the next, and vice versa. And manufacturing started learning, okay, if we save them up for this kind of weather, we can get a better <laughs> yield and we save them up. And, and so lots of games were, were, were played uh, with that. We wound up 
on every head making traces, sending them through temperature cycles, through, through um, uh, hot and cold, and then making traces with, with a stylus instrument. And a uh, very long, painful uh, uh, process for it. It turned out to be quite a successful from a, from a, uh, you know, from a machine standpoint. And, and the, the design person on that was, was a, or the, the leader of that was a, a guy by the name of Dwight Breda. And I also learned a lot about standards at this uh, point. And that was because, uh, because our, our test yields varied so much. We had, uh, we had gold standards, silver standards, and working standards. So we would take a working standard and periodically during the day run it on the, on the, uh, on the tester with a, the same thing for heads. We had you know, gold, silver, and, and working in order to make sure everything was calibrated because people couldn't believe that these the outputs were varying this much. So standards, that became uh, uh, very important, particularly at, uh, on that program and then going forward. The, the, uh, uh, I, I'd like to spend a minute about the ferrite core. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Yeah, the, the ferrite cores that were being made in Poughkeepsie, New York, and it was done in a batch fabrication where, there, where uh, two pieces were glass bonded together with a gap and then the, it was sliced, sliced yeah. and then sliced again. So we had U-shaped cores with a, with a throat and a, and a gap that were all glassed together. Uh, you know, like any manufacturing uh, process, there's problems come and go. And we had stuff that was, we call crap in the gap. And it was, uh, there would be spots of th stuff in the gap. And so I made a couple of trips to Poughkeepsie, and that's where I met a, a gentleman by the name of Miles Cook, who ran that operation. And it became significant because uh, the next programs that we were going to use were going to use ferrite cores. And, and the ferrite core division was done back east because they had core memories. Well, core memories were going out. They had all these guys who knew about ferrite. So Miles Cook and Hal Turk, the, who was in ferrite, and Duane Secrets was glass, and, and Walt Nystrom doing magnetics, all moved out to San Jose to support us on our next uh, products, which is the 3330 and, uh, I mean, yeah, 3330 and uh, 2305. And the, uh, there's, there's, there's one story I think that's kind of interesting to show you that on the 2314. As we were going into product test, we, we would get these random errors all, of, all the time. And people couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. We, and we, there was actually two phenomena that had taken place. One you probably know, and that was the Mount Umanum. Yeah, the, I was going to mention the radar. The, ra was the radar uh, went around, it would come with a blip, blip, blip. Yeah. And we had these long pigtails that went from the arm to the, uh, to, to the read-write channel. And in addition to that, while we were accessing, we get some other random errors. And then someone figured out that the, the, the wires from the head were put inside of plastic tubes. And those tubes would touch one another, and there'd be a static electricity uh, discharge. So kind of like overnight, we came up with a, or someone came up with a solution of putting a spring around the, the plastic oh, tube. That's why, and that supported all of these tubes. It, sub it also shielded from the Mount Umanum effect, and it also obviously stopped the static electricity because it, it was grounded. So the next couple of, of, of uh, machines had these wire springs around the, the tubes holding the wires. I remember seeing that. I didn't know why. Yeah. Uh, for the uh, uh, people who may not be local, you might explain what Mount Umanum is all about. Oh, M Mount Umanum was a military installation with a great big radar station up on the hill. We could see it, although the... You still see it, and, and now yes. it's a park. You can go up there. Yeah, it's a park. But it used to be that the government would deny it was there, even though you could see it. <laughs> but it was a facility that was there to, to, you know, to uh, as, as scan the coast for, for enemy... Um, enemy aircraft. Aircraft, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And they had very powerful radar. I remember uh, our contractor, uh, his television would go screwy once in a while, and he got on a first-name basis with the guy up in the uh, up in Mount Omano. He said, hey, 
point your aerial <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, a kind of a few of people that that uh, uh, Jack Payne was my. I was still a Q, QA guy. Jack Payne was my uh, was Normal. my manager. Yeah. Uh, we had lapping machines that were were invented by Lothar Schicker, and uh, I don't know if you remember. Uh, oh yes. Uh, Lothar, and. Uh, uh, Oh, uh, Ray Herrera and uh, and George Santana from and uh, from the uh, from the development lab, and then there was a, there was a uh, I, I don't know if you remember, but because this was so such a difficult head to build, we had uh, one of the, the lab technicians, Yvette. I don't remember oh, her yes. her remember name, yeah. but she came over and trained uh, uh, operators. I remember. And that. and you know some. Basically, we were hiring housewives, and some of them had, you know, done lots of sewing and things like that, and were quite adept. And others were not. So we would have to give them uh, jobs that would match their, their skills. Uh, this was also where I learned to put in long, long hours. This was this was 33. I mean, uh, system 360 days, and the. Uh, uh, a enormous amount of pressure was put on us to deliver and of course we were trying to deliver on a product that was that had very very poor yields so the, the uh, uh, I spent you know long days and long nights and was very involved with a number of the solutions to various problems and as a result of that I got an outstanding contribution award and was one of the, at the at the end of a program, the development lab would have a big party, invite everybody there, and I was one of three guys from manufacturing that was there. So I felt really, very, very privileged. Uh, so it was it was a, a good, good program for me. I learned about a lot about uh, elec uh, electrical testing, and uh, about stylus instruments and measuring. Uh, we'd measure curvature with optical flats and monochromatic light, and. Uh, Anyway. It, oh, you mentioned in your uh, uh, little history here something about fretting corrosion. Oh, yes. That was a, that's a, another kind of story. We were, we were concerned about the, uh, the load point touching the ceramic that we would get, uh, that we would get corrosion because it wasn't in the same, quite the same plane. And uh, it, it, for both this program and the next program, so we, we uh, the manufacturing engineers guys built a machine that would had a that had a stage that would pivot and it was supposed to do is make a motion so, like a head would do flying over a disc would and so and there was i think 12 stations on this and it was run by little motors and it would it would be running 24 hours a day and and uh it was so noisy we we kept it in the build the basement of building 15 and i would go over there you know once a week or so and check on it. And what we really found was the fretting corrosion wasn't nearly as much of a problem as it was keeping the machine going because it wore the machine out <laughs> all the time. And it was a well-designed machine. It just shows, you know, that, that uh, the lengths that IBM went now, to. Now, these were made of stainless steel. Why would they corrode? Oh, I mean, oh these, these were, uh, uh, yeah, well, if you have stainless steel rubbing or wearing, for example, yeah. then then the byproduct of that is always looks or rusty. Chips. Yeah. It always looks rusty, and so we were concerned: one, if there would be dimensional change, and two, that would be a source of contamination in the in the file. So, uh, actually, after that, I I uh, moved to the development lab. Uh, that's where you know where my heart was from my engineering sure. education. I wanted to, to design things. And uh, so I, I got a job working for Eric Solist on the 2305 uh, program. Now this was a nine element fixed head. You might talk a little bit about what it was, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a nine element fixed head. Single disc? And, and it was gonna go into a, a disc stack. The discs were gonna spin at 6,000 RPM. And they would have either a head for track or a head on either side of the disc so you would only have to have half the latency. So the, the, the challenge uh, was to make heads that would, that would uh, uh, where this head could read the other head's uh, information and that they could be lined up properly. 
and it meant for some very tight tolerances. And Eric Solis came up with a, a technique of making the heads uh, kind of an extension of the ferrite core work. And what he did is made the body of the slider was all made of ferrite. And then there's actually a description of that, of that process in the books I, I showed at the beginning. And uh, they were glass bonded together. And by slicing and, uh, and dicing and grinding the ferrite, you'd make a little uh, head that was, uh, oh, roughly uh, a half inch long by 3 eighths inch and with nine elements on it. And it had extremely tight tolerances. Uh, for example, the air bearing was a taper flat bearing, and it was made by, uh, by uh, uh, lapping with a, uh, in the, with what we called a sign plate. So we'd lap the, the surface flat, and then we, uh, we would tip the whole head over, and then we would lap the next surface. And the, the way we controlled the amount of lapping is that we had a, a ceramic ring around it that was a stop ring. So as it's, as it's lapping away, as soon as the stop ring has much larger area, and so it would stop the, the lapping process at the, given, at the appropriate at a point. Uh, the, one, of, one of the kind of funny stories for this is, is that uh, uh, manufacturing had started a, had, uh, an advanced manufacturing engineering group. And these, the team there had looked at the, at the Zeus or 2305 uh, head and looked at all the tolerances, the indexing tolerances, the gap tolerance was, was uh, micro inches, the flatness was micro inches, and that's millionths of an inch. The indexing was, was uh, 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 tenths of a thousandth of, of, of an inch. And they said, there's no way we can make this. There's no way in the world we can make this. And they said in the first place, they took the 2314 yield, which is a ferrite core, and they said, you have nine of those, so we have, uh, we would take the yield to the ninth power, and the, and the yield would be zero. zero. Yes, but, but obviously it wasn't true, because they, they were completely different. And we, made, we had processes that were set up in the, in the lab that we transferred to manufacturing that virtually gave, uh, I think, near 100% yields. It, it was, we did a massive uh, amount of work on indexing. We took relatively in, uh, inexpensive grinder slicers and put on uh, uh, either lasers, uh, interferometers, or Heidenheim glass scales so that we can index very, very accurately. I mean, when I say index, we can index to like 10 micro inches or something like that. And then we had processes for uh, uh, dressing the wheels. We did a thing for the apex and, uh, uh, that, that needed to be uh, very smooth with what's called a cup grinding wheel. And the cup grinding wheel would, would, would literally put, produce a, a very smooth, shiny uh, surface at an angle. And this had to be done, I think, I can't remember if it was 45 or 30 degree angle or something like that. How did you convince management to go ahead? Manufacturing engineering says, uh, no, we can't do this. Well, I think we did that, we did that by ex demonstrating what came off the processes. We had, the, um, we had lapping machines that, get, that produce, uh, I mean, it was easier to make them flat than it was to measure them, to be honest with you. And uh, so we used, again, monochromatic light to, uh, uh, to measure, you know, compared to an optical, surf uh, optical flat surface for inspections. Uh, we also did flying heights on them. The flying heights were done flying on a glass disc. I remember those. And uh, so the head would fly over a glass disc and a monochromatic light source was used. We'd change the frequencies, see how the band shifted, and we would know how, what, the, what the spacing was. And, and then when they saw what we had done for the, uh, uh, for the machines, they could, they could say, yeah, we can do that. And so they set up a line, lines. Uh, oh, they also did the ferrite manufacturing. So that's no longer done in Poughkeepsie. It was done in, in San Jose. So they ground the powder and, or mixed it and, 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 and centered it and then sliced it and did all, all the work. It, it became, they called it the stiff finger line. And that means that you'd set the machines up and there would be a whole bed with, you know, there'd be, you know, hundreds of, of, of uh, 
pieces on the surface, and an operator would push the button and then it would go do its job, whether it was slicing or whether it was uh, beveling or, or grinding, whatever it happened to be. And one operator could run four, four machines. I mean, it, it was, it was a, a, a very, I, I would say, not completely automated, but it was... Uh, semi-automatic. Yeah, semi-automatic, uh, automated. And, uh, and, and that, this becomes very critical, this particular line, and being able to process these ferrite heads. Because the, uh, well, let me do is, is kind of bring a, a few, uh, I think I mentioned that, that uh, uh, Eric Solis was, was the inventor of the process uh, for that. And we had guys like uh, on the team like uh, Elliot Flughout, and uh, Elliot was responsible for, I don't think he did the air bearing design, I think that was done by Tom Tang, but he was responsible for the loading and for specification generation, standard generations. Uh, George Powell uh, worked on the program, John Ramos. Uh, there was a, oh, I can't remember. You mentioned glass cracks. and. Ah, uh, yes. That's, we had, we had a, a problem that, that we would get small cracks that were observable under the microscope. And this was the case of how, uh, you know, when I say right specifications, you, you know, how flat is flat, how round is round, you know, uh, how clean is clean. You know, some of those are very difficult to say. I look at this, it looks clean. Well, it may have all sorts of stuff on it. So usually we would do is, is for those kinds of things, is come up with kind, some kind of a, of a test for it, like cleaning. Uh, we found, uh, we would put things through an ultrasonic cleaners uh, process, and one batch would really look, or one, one line would really look great, and the other line looked terrible. We said, what's going on? Well, it turns out we had different brands of ultrasonic cleaners. So then somebody came up with a bouncing ball test. I don't know if you remember that. We would put a, a beaker, a flat bottom beaker, with little BBs on it, and then some lines, and it would set that in the in the uh, ultrasonic cleaner, and then measure how high the bump the beads went. So if they went at you know two millimeters high, that was you know that was one one. You go to another one and go at four, and then you say, oh yeah, I need to have at least four to get the parts clean. You know, so there were there was all kinds of crazy tests that were that were that were done that way. But anyway, on the cracks, we had to develop a a. Uh, some sort of criteria, what was good and what was bad. And while we were developing that, we were doing tests. We would load and load on the disc and, because we were afraid that, it would, that the head would, would uh, the crack would uh, grow. So I, I personally went on the end of the line and viewed every crack and put it into a go, no go, or test bin. And I did that day and night. Lou Blenderman would come out and say, you know, how are you doing, how are you doing? Uh, on it, uh, he was he was the, like uh, my second level uh, manager at the time, and, and so it, it, it was uh, until we figured out that the cracks actually were not a problem; they didn't grow, and that there were the, it, it was uh, just cosmetic. It was it was cosmetic. The, the crack actually had re uh, released whatever stress was there. There was still enough good uh, material. It wasn't like the cracks we get in metal, you know, that fatigue or whatever. Uh, let's see, there, there was uh, one of the things that, when, this was my first time to be in the development lab, and in the development lab, uh, to make these early heads, uh, they, we hired watchmakers yeah. and uh, really skilled, we took the best uh, technicians from the line and brought them over, and there were guys like Chuck Snyder and, and uh, Chuck Blackley were watchmakers, and Alta Wright and, and uh, Valerie Peterson, you know, were, were assembly operators. And um, one of the, the things we had to be careful about is these people were so skilled, they could assemble things or do things, and then you put them to manufacturing, and the, the, they couldn't do it, or they would get terrible yields for it. So we always had to keep watching over their shoulder so that we didn't put settle on something that was, uh, that was too hard uh, to build. Yeah. yeah. Uh, see, I remember the 2305 actually went 
very smoothly. We had no, no big production problems with it. And uh, I don't know if you remember, Carmen Rosado was the program uh, manager for that. But he was a tough guy, and, uh, but uh, he kept the whole program on, on, uh, on schedule. And I think and Miles Cook's team had moved out to San Jose, so we were making our own glass, making our own ferrite, so forth. We, so we had... Uh, Where was that done? I don't remember... Uh, it, it was in, in building uh, 13. It was all done on the uh, east side. There's the ferrite labs, and then the you know the glass lab, and the and the. Um, um, I was in um, building 13. I, I thought it was on the east side, but maybe it was. Well, it got moved around, Bill, okay. after you left. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, the, uh, after the the uh, uh, the 2305, then the third, I was assigned to the 23, I mean, the 3340 program. That's the how Winchester. How was the 2305 in production? I, I was not familiar with that program. I, I don't know how long it was in production. One of the things at the time, when you're a technologist, you work on the technology stuff and all the other machine group and that thing, we didn't, we didn't pay any attention to, unfortunately. But uh, any, anyway, so then the, uh, uh, the 3340, which is Winchester or the 33, I mean the 3030, right. because it was going to be two, two uh, modules of 30 megabits each. And Ken Houghton was the, uh, was the uh, program manager, and uh, Chris Kaluris was the uh, engineering manager for that. And I remember he made a presentation to us, and so we were going to do a, this whole new concept, and that was the head would stay with the disk, and that we would do start, stop, and contact, and that module would carry the heads around and not just the, the, uh, the disk pack. This would allow us to do is uh, get rid of a whole lot of tolerances and a whole lot of risk as far as crashing. And, uh, well, the, the, uh, and it was quite novel uh, in, its, in its approach. Uh, it would also use a, a closed-loop servo. Now, the 3330 uh, used a closed-loop servo and was the first one out of I IBM plant to, to do that. You might back up to that. It, uh, that was a predecessor of the 3340, uh, and I know you worked on that as well. Well, I actually did not do very much. I worked in the same lab area. There was, you know, got involved some, but, but we had, uh, uh, Dwight Breda had the, the, the 3330 group, and uh, Eric Solis had the 2305 group. And so while we were next door neighbors, uh, they did their thing and we did our thing. I mean, obviously there was lots of talking, but, but uh, it w they, were, they were quite separate. And uh, anyway, going back to, to, to the 2314, uh, we also did something with 23, I mean, uh, not 2314, the 3340. We also did something uh, whom we call the WE program. And the WE program was, uh, the 2314 had all this contention going on between the development guys and the manufacturing guys because manufacturing said, you gave us a product we can't make and, and you know, the development guy said, we did the best we can and, here's, and we're here, here to help you and so forth. But there was, there was a lot of animosity and it had, it had been that way for some time. So Jack Harker came up with this, uh, this concept of the WE program, and we took a, a bunch of guys from manufacturing, a bunch of guys from the development lab, and there was an uh, ACS, Advanced Computer System, uh, had been a lab up in Mental Park that had just been closed down. And they had a bunch of process engineers uh, there. And we, we took the whole gang and moved it to Mental Park. And the, the idea was the initial part of the program was going to be managed by development, meaning the development guy, there was a development guy, uh, Ken Machado, who kind of oversaw the, the whole thing. And he had Eric Solis working for him, and then they had manufacturing people uh, also. And then later on, the management would, would transfer to, uh, uh, to manufacturing. And development people would go to, go to manufacturing to help on that. So that was this, this WE concept, which, by the way, I think turned out to work quite successful. And uh, I was on uh, part of the program, and I spent the last part of, of the Winchester program 
uh, I spent a year in manufacturing, working on the yields and and how to improve things and and uh, uh, any issues that would that would come up. So they had, you know, live engineers there for it. Now, the the we started out. This program was based on a tri pad head, not tri rail, but three pads. Each pad had a little taper flat bearing on it, and in the rear pad had was a glassed in core, and the glassed in core was um, uh, was something that had been developed by the 3330 uh, team because they took a glass ferrite core, then they used another glass that melted at a different temperature to to hold it there, and, and it and it had been used on a small file that Walt Buslick had worked on. But what we found as we tried to make it, it was almost impossible to make in volumes. The taper flat, because there's a taper, there's a taper that has to be done in, inside the head, and there's no way to get at it. I mean, it was very difficult to get at it. We, had, we tried all kinds of wild things. So uh, I set out about looking at making another type of head like a taper flat bearing, but it, but it would be, uh, it, it, it wouldn't be a tri-pad, it would just be a two-rail head. And we would insert the core in, in the back end of it. Go ahead. Now, when you mentioned the uh, tri-pad head, uh, uh, Al Shugart in his talk uh, commented that uh, it was a data disk design. I remember seeing the thing in the lab, uh, and is, is that the one you modeled, or you were talking about? Well, that's the one we started off with. And that's the one that, that proved to be, to us, unmanufacturable. Yeah, I understand. So then we, we went to, uh, so I started to work on a design for a, a, a different air bearing, something that we could make. And I used Tom Tang's air bearing uh, uh, program, and I got onto the uh, research, I think it was a 7090, I don't know, but it's the biggest IBM computer going at the time, which was, I'm sure, much less than a, than, than a, PC or something is today, but um, and the way you did, did your job is you typed up a bunch of uh, punch cards, put them in as a batch in the evening, and they would run it. And then the next morning you go and you get your data point. Then you punch in some more cards and usually a few cards and insert them in the deck, run it again. Then you get another data point. Well, this was going to take forever. I mean, one point a night, and you needed hundreds of points. So I found uh, a, a computer operator at the data center who would let me put jobs in whenever I could, because my jobs were not, didn't, didn't take a lot of time. They, were, they weren't uh, accounting jobs or things like that. It was just short computation printed out. And so I, I spent all night long, every night, making these runs. And it was during, while, during, and then I would plot points, put another card in, do another run, and then I would still have some data at the end, and I would I bring it back to the lab, in, uh, to uh, Mendel Park, and I had a technician, Nick Nichols, who would, who would uh, uh, plot the data up. What I found out is that you made the, the, the uh, uh, 2305 was a wide, like half inch wide head. I found that when you made the rails very skinny, that the pressure built up in front of the taper like normal, but that it would also bleed off towards the trailing edge. And so on one rail, it would look like it had a spike in the front, dip down, and then it would have a, a, a spike at the bottom. This meant was like a two-legged chair. So if I put two rails, I would have a four-legged chair. So I, I discovered this phenomenon and started designing uh, uh, a bearing. So I, I would, I found that, that uh, I could make these bearings that would have uh, like four, four, four pressure four points. points yeah. and, uh, and, and then I had to do the work of, of designing one for a, for a machine. Uh, you have to have pitch stiffness and roll uh, stiffness and, uh, and compliance because the disc is fluttering and so the head has to, to be able to, to follow that. And, and we wanted to have the core at the trailing edge. So in this particular design, the, the head pivoted about the trailing edge, which was very fortunate. So uh, I started doing all of the tolerance work, 
the width tolerances, the taper tolerances, uh, how wide the slider should be, and, and I basically had a, a, a two rail head. And as I thought about this, and then I thought, you know what? If we use the, the 235 or Zeus product process, I could make a rail in the middle that would be narrow, whatever the track width was, which was like, you know, three or four mils, something like that. And, and that would not contribute to, to the lift of the slider. So um, I came, you know, put that in my notebook, went to, back to Eric Solist and said, here's, here's a design for the, uh, the head. It's using the, the process that we had used in the Zeus line. We knew how to index very accurately. We knew how to cup wheel grind. Uh, we knew how to do the lapping with the sign plates. Uh, we knew how to glass bond for it. Uh, we said, we th and, and because uh, we were doing a head uh, had to stay with a disc, and in this the design they actually had two heads per, the, per each surface, the cost of the heads was very critical. Kind of typical cost, and even way back then, of a, of a 2314 or so, I, I think it was in the neighborhood of 18, 15 to 20 dollars, something like that. And so our target was to be less than a dollar. So we said, this is the best chance we have. Of, it's not going to take, there won't be lines of girls. The only thing I have to do is wind a coil and terminate it and, and, and add and put the, the suspension on. And we put a notch in the back so we could clip the, uh, the suspension in like we had done on the, on the Zeus product or the 2305. And, and uh, uh, that looked like a good way to go. Now we had some you know, there were people who were working on the on the tri uh, pad head, who were kind of uh, married to that. So it was a little bit of a problem. Uh, we had a few come to Jesus meetings a about uh, this process, but I think they all saw, yeah, we could make this much cheaper. And and a bunch of those people had not been familiar with the uh, with the Zeus line and the stiff finger. So we got we actually got set up to to do that. Uh, to make those heads, actually, I think down in, in the San Jose lab, and we did the assembly work in uh, in Menlo Park, and uh, the uh, this guy uh, Richard Wilkinson worked on the suspension. He was in in the in the department, so we worked uh, together closely on that, and we made a suspension assembly with a welded on load beam, and the spring was part of it, and that's the familiar Winchester head suspension, and. Uh, uh, there, there's a oh, and then we we because we had four heads per arm, we wanted to be able to test each of the heads magnetically and then mount them to the arms. Because if you mount it to the arm and then you find one of them's bad, then you have to disassemble everything and so forth. So we we put uh, area consisted on what's called a mounting plate. So we had a mounting plate that was, was then a testable unit that would mount on the arms. And then George Powell. Uh, came up with and worked out a thing for swedging it. And it was, we, we had aluminum arm and a stainless steel uh, uh, mounting plate, and we had a little spud on the, on the, on the bottom uh, that was hollow, so we could put a tool through, or initially we just pushed a ball bearing through. And that spread out the stainless steel and pushed into the aluminum. The aluminum uh, modulus is, uh, uh, is much less, and so, as the stainless steel would dis, would yield, and the uh, and the aluminum would would just be compressed, and the aluminum would keep grabbing it, so it held it very tight. You just put push it through. It's much quicker than than screws or anything like that. I mean, literally, you can. Uh, I think it went at one place uh, on the manufacturing line. They automated it, so you just place it and run it run a tool through. So you didn't have to do. I mean, you put them in a fixture. And, uh, just use the ball once? Uh, well, th what they did later on is just had a plunger. Just put a hardened plunger that went through. Yeah. All, so that was, that was kind of a neat thing. One of the kind of the funny, interesting stories for me was the, the, the machine group wanted to be able, because they had to put all these four heads inside between the disc in this narrow space. They wanted a, a, a cam 
on the suspension. So they could put a, a pickle fork, that we called it, and that would pull all the heads down, put them between the discs, and then you pull the p pickle fork out and the heads would, would go back, release and go back onto the disc. So we built the first one with a, with a, a stamped load beam and, uh, and uh, the, the, the gimbal suspension part. Uh, sent them down for, for uh, testing in the machine group. And they, they sang like birds. They were terrible. They just had resonance all over the place. And so what we, we, uh, we had a, uh, uh, a group under Ray Abaziad and uh, that was looking at head media interfaces and things like that. We did some tests where we took on, we put the, suspension, the head suspension flying on the disc, then used a strobe light, and then excited the, the suspensions at the same frequency so we could see all the rest. We just scan, do a sweep scan, so we could see all the resonant frequencies and see all the modes of vibration. Well, there's a mode where this, because of this cam was on one side of the suspension and not on the other, that it, it was just moving all over the place. Due to the air, air No, just no. just because you're accessing, just because you're 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 uh, vibrating it. I mean that's that's what a, a a voice coil actuator is just like a shaker table. You know, it, it's and so if you energize it at the right frequency and always when you're seeking different lengths, there's some place in there where you get that uh, component. So it would excite it and and uh, create the problem. Well, that's when I started to learn more about servo systems and what goes on. We had never before, I had never before worked with uh, a system that had closed loop servo. It had always been a detent, and, and so there's no feedback. Nothing comes, feeds back and to the hydraulic oil or anything like that. The 3330 had that, but uh, it, it hadn't been necessarily a big problem that I knew about. But in the, in the uh, 3340, it, turned out to be an enormous problem. So we quickly redesigned the, the load beam so it was symmetrical, absolutely symmetrical. We had the wires before had run down one side and the cam was on the other. We now ran the wires down the middle of the load beam and we put cams on both sides. So then while one cam would, ne would never be used, one would be used and, and that solved the problem. As soon as we made it symmetrical, then it, it would, uh, uh, that it would function in the in the in the service system, and, and now kind of related to that is a, is another story. Hersley was making a, a 62 PC, I think it was, uh, file using I think eight inch discs, and uh, and a rotary actuator. Now Hersley's in England, right? Hersley England, Hersley England Labs, and they were making uh, files for low end systems, so. Power and heat and size were really important for, for them, and, but they, but and, and cost was was extremely important. So if they could pick up a Winchester low cost head, then that was a big savings for them. Well, they they put their first system together, and uh, and, and uh, the rotary actuator has an arm with the, with the head sticking out. So it, it's sort of like a linear motion, but it has some radial component to it. Because like an old-fashioned record player. Yes, like an old-fashioned record player, sort of. Yeah, except that the head is mounted at right angles at, at, at the end, at, at, in their particular case. Uh, but there is some, some radial component as, as you go in and out. Well, they put the first ones together and they said, oh no, we're having terrible problems. We, our, our servo system's unstable, our body plots look terrible. So uh, they said, can, can San Jose help us? So I got sent over there, and that was my first trip to Hursley. And uh, I went over there, and, and the, uh, I, I looked at the oscilloscope, looked at the pony plots, and said, would, would you guys disassemble the drive for me? And they, sure, and there's the management, the engineers are all looking there. And I go under the microscope, and I says, does somebody have some, some nippers, some cutters? And some a technician ran and got them. And I went in there and snipped off the two cams. And they said, you can't do that. I said, why not? I, I put them on, I can take them off. <laughs> and, and so we reassembled 
and that solved the problem completely. So that the Hersley pro product used the, tw the, uh, the, the Winchester slider suspension with the cams cut off. And, it, and the reason was, while everything was, was symmetrical for a linear, when you went in a rotary motion, the cams were, would, the whole suspension would rock because it was not, it was not on the same plane. They, they, they hung down. So lessons learned about, about uh, servo systems. Yeah, when you change, uh, you have to watch out for the un unintended consequences. Yeah. Uh, let's see, I had a couple Well, of you mentioned some synergies. The, the fact that the 3340 would not have worked had it not been for the super flat 3330. Ah, uh, yes, yes, that, that's true. Uh, the tri-rail, not tripad, tri-rail, meaning the two outside air bearing rails and the center uh, rail that did the reading and writing, uh, would not have worked if we had had the, the, the older style disc. By having a disc that had been diamond turned, it was very, very flat. And you can see, if you have a tri-rail, if the disc is curved underneath, then that changes the spacing of the head of the read-write element to the gap. So it, it that that was a fortuitous thing that happened. Otherwise, this particular design, we would have had to insert a core and it would have cost uh, a lot a, more. A side note for the audience, uh, what Mike is talking about is the uh, original disc process used a brush polishing technique, which left the disc on a microscopic scale kind of lumpy. And so trying to fly over a lumpy surface is not too great. Yeah. And Germany came up with uh, the idea in Sindelfingen uh, of uh, diamond turning the substrate, made it super flat. And uh, so without that technique, the 3340 would yeah. have had problems. There's, there's, because of the start stop in contact, uh, and we are now, the head and the disc are meeting each other intentionally before they would meet unintentionally if they, <laughs> when, when you're loading and unloading. Uh, we, we started up a, a group uh, called, uh, for lack of a better term, I don't know if I had another term of uh, uh, me the, uh, mechanical integrity. And it looked at, uh, it was looking at wear and uh, uh, lubricants, uh, the, the uh, study, you know, tribology, study of, of lubricants on surfaces. They did a lot of, of uh, uh, instrumentation work. They did things, for example, uh, they made uh, uh, glide height sliders with piezoelectric crystals on them so that if they hit an asperity, the piezoelectric crystal would vibrate and, and give a, a output signal. And there, there are guys in, in that group like, uh, well, I think uh, uh, Ray Singh and I remember Gene Zert, uh, I think he worked on, on those. And they worked on heads that would actually mow down asperities. Any of the little things sitting on top that would do is, is clip it and mow it down. And that's, that'll come become important in a, when I talk in a few minutes. And there's guys like uh, Chua Lin and uh, uh, Bob Sullivan and uh, uh, a, a number of oh, Murray Hill, a bunch of really talented guys in, in, that, in that group. And they supported the technology. While we were doing the actual designing and developing and testing, they were doing kind of an overall bigger uh, uh, test. They also took over the, uh, the air bearing program. Not necessarily the design with the air bearing because we would design that, we would, but we'd use their tools. And then there was another group called uh, uh, the Channel Integration. <clears throat> and the Channel Integration group was taking the heads and the media and the read-write channel and putting those together and testing those to see, and, and they were helping us sort out the tolerances. And their, their tool was, uh, they had an enormous, big, great, big granite block that was, uh, as a test stand, they cut a hole so that it was, it was isolated from the building, mm -hmm. you know, so it wasn't attached to the building. It had a big spherical, uh, I, th I can't remember, I think nine inch or, or larger, uh, 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 graphite, carbon uh, air bearing uh, with like, you know, a fraction of a micro inch run out or something like that. The, the heads were positioned on air bearing slides 
with, with laser interferometer controls. So they could position extremely accurately a head over the, a disc. And they would then do tests, tests on how capable was the head media uh, to tolerate off track. Now, remember the other heads that I talked about had either, they either the old style was right wide, read narrow, and, and all, erase the side tracks. Well, in, in this particular case, it, with the Winchester technology, there was no side erase. You just wrote, so you had to position accurately enough to stay within that range. Now, when you look at all the tolerances, servo tolerances, thermal tolerances, tilts, um, head width tolerances, uh, disc flutter, everything that, that creates some sort of misregistration, were all evaluated by that group. And then we would do is kind of divvy up the to up who got what. You know, we got this much for the head width tolerance. The disc got this much for their for their tolerances. The servo got that much, and so it was a very important activity. And that was had you know the, the guys that I mostly worked with that it would be uh, there was uh, Jack Schwartz was from the, the channel, but uh, Jack Grogan and Andy Gaday and guys like that were involved with the channel integration. So. I, IBM was investing an enormous amount of money in the, setting the groundwork and the basis for technology that, that small companies could never do. Yeah. They, but but uh, as a result of that, when we came out making heads with this kind of tolerances, we knew that they would work. And when, it, when other companies on the outside used Winchesters, uh, they, they would use similar How similar long did it take to prove out a design? Uh, it would take years. I mean, I mean literally, the they, they, group, you know, they, they would do is, they would test, and they just, they tested like 24 hours a day. I mean, there was, there was tests going on. The same thing with start-stop testing and lubricant testing and things like that. That testing went on before, you know, as components, before it ever went into the machine to go to, to product test. So it, it's, it's an area that I think, you know, lots of people not, might not know about. Yeah, and, I, uh, yeah. huh? I, I didn't know about that. Yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned lubricants a couple of times. Was the Winchester disc lubricated? Yes, it had to be lubricated because of the start stopping. Yeah, in, in that's content. probably the first product that was lubricated. I, I, th I think the, the this little project that that had done before with the tri uh, pad head, I think had had been lubricated, and there were people. There was guys. Frank Talkey from Research was involved with it. Uh, Ray Abizai's group were involved. There was a bunch of people that were involved, and the lubricants was super secret. I mean, I mean, lubricants, they, they were never even even shipped to the San Jose site. They were shipped to another plant, and then they were to another plant, and then in. I mean, it, they did everything they could to, to uh, hide what lubricant. You know, as a, uh, I didn't have a need to know, so I never knew. <laughs> <laughs> well, try it was something maybe by DuPont called Crytox. But, and yeah, there, there, were, there were a number of them, and yeah. ones at different times. And the problems with the lubricants, one, they had, they had to stay there for, you know, for years on a spinning disc. Uh, it turns out that the head is a very good collector. I mean, it's pushing along and has this bevel surface in the front, and it'll collect any kind of, uh, of dirt and crud or whatever else that goes, goes on. And it'll also tend to do is, is uh, you know, push up lubricant and, uh, and, the, and then provide the real, the real uh, lubricant surface. And as you know, there's particles in the in the coating that were also helping the, the wear, and those had to be controlled. I mean, they, they, they there was a lot of technology in trying to in making the amazing amount of diverse technology. Yeah. Yes, right. Uh, by the way, that's part of what made I think the disc drive uh, uh, industry so interesting for somebody like myself. Yeah, me so too. There was, you know. Uh, all kinds of materials stuff that was involved, all kinds of process stuff that was going on. There's ceramics, there's, there's castings, there's uh, uh, flex cables, there's, you know, thermosonic bonding, there's all, all, all manner of things. The, there are finite element analysis, air bearing analysis, you know, the, it was, uh, it, it was great. We, did, we didn't have PCs, so everything had to be run on big computers. Ah, you know that when we were doing the X-bar and R charts and all that stuff? Well, we would plot the data to, to, to do with a freed in hand calculators. We'd put the data, crank, crank. So that, that's how we, in the beginning, and, uh, and all the, 
the minutes, we'd write them by hand, give them to the secretary, she'd type them up on a mimeograph, and you know, that was the 2311 time. 2314, we had Xerox machines. <laughs> yeah. That was the big advance. Oh yeah, I remember uh, building uh, uh, the development lab, or no, the uh, research lab had the first uh, Xerox 914. And they had a fire extinguisher right beside it <laughs> because <laughs> once in a while it'd catch fire. <laughs> or there was risk of catching fire. Risk, risk of catching fire, yeah. Uh, so, the, kind of, uh, there was a, a really uh, rich cast of characters on the, on the 3340. I, I think I men mentioned, uh, uh, you know, Ken Houghton and Chris Kalouris. Uh, Dick Mulvaney, a uh, very creative uh, guy who worked with Ru Rudy Listener on the kind of basic uh, module uh, design. Shell Ellis and uh, Jim Lucky was, came, uh, and Bob Friesen, I think, uh, uh, showed up. D Dr. Dick Oswald, I think, was the initial designer of the, yeah, of the servo sure system. And Jim Gilmore. Uh, so there, there was a lot of, of good guys that were uh, working on that. And, and remember, these are casts of hundreds. So there are a lot of engineers each doing their, their, uh, their piece. Uh, one of the areas we had um, a result of the taper flat bearing and uh, start stop in contact is we had a thing called stiction. Uh, it was probably the biggest, I think, the biggest single problem that, uh, that the program experienced. And that was, uh, it, it was this was an open loop um, airflow, so it collected air from the outside, went through a, a filter and, and, and around, uh, kind of supposedly sweeping the place clean. But it turned out that there's a, a Initially, there was some washing process that was used in the disks that uh, left some contaminants on, and the contaminants would, would co combine with the lube after a while. It would make kind of a sticky stuff. And the, uh, you know, this was um, angstrom's thick probably, but not much. But we have very flat heads, and the heads would, would stick to the disk. And we had a, because we had to have a, a rapid spin up for uh, for starting and stopping contact. You know, you couldn't drag the head along a ways that would, or it wear. So we spun very quickly. So we had a, a big motor. So the big motor, every once in a while, it would just rip all the heads off the suspensions. So we'd go there and there would be a few heads around the outside casing and a bunch stuck to the, it would just tear the suspensions off. So there, there were, stiction kind of uh, was a problem for every, uh, taper flat bearing uh, product we had. And the issue was if you could keep control of the environment, then you were then you were great. But if you had any kind of contamination that got in uh, that you didn't know about, either introduced in the manufacturing process or somehow got in from the uh, you know from from the outside environment, uh, then then it could collect. Because the head, as I say, it was a really good collector. It went around just but the taper would scoop up stuff. So how'd you fix this problem? Well, in, it, initially it was one of, of getting, changing the cleaning process, so we got rid of the, of the whatever it was that, was that left a residue. And I think it was, uh, and I don't remember the details of it, uh, but, and then in general, uh, keeping things very clean and well filtered so that you could actually let the, the head media interface work as designed. Yeah. Yeah. I know in the 3330 uh, we've had to use uh, HEPA filters because the aerosol, uh, the greasy stuff in the air from jet planes and cars yes, would absolutely. get in. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's why all these used HEPA filters on the... Yeah, on so the, that was the first use of HEPA filters. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, and, and I, there was another, I think it was a... Uh, I don't remember, it was a... 30, I think 3350 or, or one of the products, we wound up with a problem in, uh, of the material that they put in, uh, in uh, cooling towers for uh, cooling the air that's for air conditioning in, in the big 
uh, glass houses, you know, where they had uh, discs, I mean, where they put disc storage. And there's, there's a, a material they used to keep the fungus from growing because it would smell musty. Yep. So, and because the cooling tower, uh, uh, you know, makes these very, very tiny droplets, uh, these, this uh, material that was a fungicide would get in the air and that would find its way through the filters and collect on the discs and created uh, crashes. Yeah, we, we saw uh, that problem on the 2311, uh, a drive at the airport was collecting a bunch of junk and it turned out there was aerosols and the uh, HEPA filter solved that. Solved that, yeah. So next you had the 3350, you worked on that. Yeah. I, I, um, a note about 3340, just to, just to oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Keep going. One, one last thing. Uh, I personally saw um, lines in Germany, Bulgaria, Japan, China, and at least three companies in the U.S. Oh, wow. All doing that. All doing that. And at one time, we almost we were going to cancel the program because we were only going to make uh, 700,000 heads. I mean, that's during the business cycle. So it, it uh, and yet they were made, you know, millions a day. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So anyway, I, I, uh, just to blow my own horn, I got an outstanding invention award and uh, uh, for, for the, the Winchester head and uh, some cash and a trip to New York, which my wife appreciated, <laughs> to make up for some of the long hours. Yeah, as I mentioned, Al Shuart thinks that's one of the four greatest inventions uh, in disk drives. Yeah. Well, okay. good. Anything else on 3340? Uh, that was no. Baby. That, that was probably where, uh, in the 30, on that program, I still worked as, a, as, a, as an engineer, and I worked as a manager, and, and obviously started learning well, I mean, you know, IBM's very good at training you. It's when you become a manager, they send you through lots of classes and things like that. So learning the, the, the initial management. The, the 3350, uh, from, a, from a technology standpoint, from a machine, it's, it's, a, it's a major departure because it no longer had movable packs. It had now fixed packs. Fixed it, machine, had, yeah. it was fixed. It had a, a, stall, a taller stack. But from a head standpoint, it was a narrow track, which was just changed the program on the stiff finger. Uh, so as it indexed over, it indexed a little bit different on that center rail. And then also the gap. Now, I think I failed to mention that the, the gaps in the, very, in the 2311 were formed by putting a copper or brass shim, and you closed the, squeezed it closed and ball staked it. And on 2314, it was formed by glass. And when they took the bars and put them together, they actually put platinum shims, because platinum wouldn't be dissolved by the glass, yeah. platinum shims on either side, and pushed them together, and then, then the glass would flow. Mm -hmm. But on, on, the, uh, on the Zeus program, we did a thing where we actually deposited uh, a material, a glass material, on the, on the uh, surface before the two halves were put together. So it was done in, in, a, in a vapor de deposition machine, so it was done extremely accurately. Uh, actually, it was uh, one of the manufacturing guys came up with a very clever way. So as it deposited here, it also deposited on a, on a, on a sheet that had an interferometer looking at it. And so it could, it could measure to to fraction of a micro inch looking at the interference fringes. And so it would deposit, deposit, and then when it got the right place, it shut the machine off. So, so when we changed it to the uh, 3350, all we did is change the setting on the... On so that's the synergy you're talking about, from one program to the next, you keep using uh, or keep improving the technology. Yes, and, and so we went from from all sorts of... of uh, I, there were plans, I, I don't know whether they were compl ever completely implemented in, in San Jose, but on the Winchester, virtually every step of the way, there were, there were plans for complete automation. It could have been done. Later on, I learned something f as far as the, how the Japanese do their automation. They set up a, a line, a manual line, and then they choose one step or another step, and they make, make a machine for it. So there'll be girls putting stuff together, goes to the machine, girls 
uh, putting stuff together. And they're almost always ladies because it's very fine, uh, tedious work. And then they would put another machine and then another machine. And then pretty soon, all the machines are working together. So they do it step at a time. It seems to be that's the way they, they, they do that. So, uh, um, so I, think, I think the 3350 from a technology standpoint was, uh, from our standpoint, was, uh, yeah, virtually nothing. Basically, it was a dedicated Winchester type of design? It was, it was, it was a dedicated Winchester. And, uh, but the capacities were taking big jumps. Capacities were taking big jumps. Performance is taking a big jump. The machine looked quite different. And, uh, uh, but the technology, the heads, media, so forth, uh, did, as I told you, just a couple changes to the heads, probably some minor changes Never to the, work. Yeah, they may have flown a little closer or something like that, although I don't even think that. Now the next one to ship was the 3370 uh, program. And it was the first program to ship the 33, I mean, ship with thin film heads. But the 3370 was kind of stuck in. Uh, it was f for the mid range, and it basically used 3380 technology. It used the thin film heads, thin film suspensions. It 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 used a it used an oxide disc. So from a, a development standpoint. Uh, it, uh, oh, I, I, I forgot one other thing that happened, I think, on the thir 3350, is we moved the, the, we had a diode selection matrix mounted on the arm, and it, in that module, they put the preamp in the diode selection module, so that we then uh, used a flex cable, uh, a uh, polyamid flex cable, that went out from the arm out to the to the read write channel, and that was a change from the leads and the mm -hmm. springs and, and so Get forth. The, because the electronics closer to the head. The electronics were closer to the head, and that because there's the tracks were narrower, then we would have uh, you know lower signal levels, and this improved the signal to noise by having the preamplifier. What was the time frame of the 3370? Uh, that's kind of not on most people's radar. Uh, it would have been the uh, a couple of years before the the 3380, uh, yeah, it, it was the the headline was up working. We had suspensions and heads and so forth, but by using the uh, oxide discs and uh, and using you know the the previous level, of, I mean, it turned out to be from a technology standpoint, it was not it was not a big program. But 3370, I think uh, Al Rizzi uh, was the program manager and. And Jim Makiyama was one of the key players for that. Where were the film heads made for that one? Well, that, they, they're all made in San Jose. Okay. Yeah, they, they came right off of the 3380 line. <coughs> Slightly different dimensions. So, um, 3380 was an enormous program. It was, it was uh, I think, probably was the, or became the, uh, uh, the largest program IBM ever ever had, and uh, I remember one of our of our uh, planning marketing guys saying it would be the largest uh, industrial program in the United States ever. Really, bigger than Boeing, bigger than whatever. It, so it it was it was destined to be a very major, a very major program. Uh, I joined it. Uh, after I finished with the 3340 and spent a year in manufacturing, I went for a short time to Inkjet, and but I was pulled in to, to uh, work on the, uh, the 3380. And, and it had just been redefined. It had been, I think, like a, a great big uh, disc horizontal, and people said uh, they were starting to understand the, the significance of space and power and you know, there's all these big rooms in New York City full of disk drives, and they needed more storage, and, and they didn't have any more room. They couldn't build new buildings, so having higher density per square foot 
was almost as important as having high, higher density per square inch as far as recording density. Anyway, to make, make a, a long story short, we started off um, went on a long pr process. I worked for years and years on the, on the 3380. And uh, the initial design work for the heads and suspensions and so forth was done relatively early on and didn't change much at all. The, the real problem was the head media interface. And uh, oh, there, there's a whole lot of technical stuff that goes on as far as the read channels and, and, and they, have, they have to change the uh, coding and you know a, a whole bunch of, of things in there, which I'm not, won't go in, they're covered in other, in other uh, oral histories. But uh, I will say that uh, one th the thin film heads were made in a batch process. There was a, a, a substrate, a couple inches square, that deposited the thin film elements on it. Well, if you make a great big slider, th then you can't make very many substrates, I mean very many sliders out of this, out of this two inch substrate. So there was a lot of pressure to bring the, the uh, make the head smaller. So, um, so you could get a, a better yield out of the out of these uh, thin film substrates. A wafer, yeah. yeah, out of this. Yeah, we call them, yeah wafer or substrates. And uh, they were going to be this the substrate was going to get sliced up, so that the the thin film element resided on the back end of the head, and we would use a taper flat bearing. All. Uh, so the design work was initially to do is select a slider size and, and the slider had to be big enough that would offer enough uh, roll stiffness and pitch stiffness and vertical compliance. Uh, it, we could, uh, we had to design a suspension for it. Suspension designs are, by the way, are very interesting because you are having very high G levels while you're accessing uh, and sometimes you hit crash stops which put way heavy loads on them. Uh, they have to be very compliant to let the, the head uh, pitch and, and roll. It has to be extremely stiff in the, uh, uh, in, in the plane. It can't move X, Y, uh, but it has to be able to move really well Z. It has to have pitch and roll. So matching the suspension and the air bearing stiffnesses is, uh, is, is somewhat of an involved uh, piece of work. And I had guys working for me, uh, Bob Watrous was working on the su suspension and Mike Garnier on the, uh, on the air bearing and Norm Freighter was doing the, the finite el element modeling. And as I think, I, as we explained, making th things very symmetrical was important for high performance servo systems. So this is a, a, a skinny triangular, uh, triangular is, is far and away the best shape to make. Uh, uh, suspension assembly with a little gimbal portion on the end and uh, and then uh, uh, the spring providing the, uh, uh, the, the the load for the for the unit the uh, on the on the Winchester a guy by the name of Richard Kurth uh, developed a technique for setting the load we used to bend the springs and if you know if you bend a piece of metal it'll creep back a little bit so the load would change or whatever. So uh, Richard was a, was a metallurgist, so he came up with a te with technique of heating the, the uh, spring to form the load. So we, he'd, he would form it, over form it, and then heat it to slowly bring the load into, in, uh, into specification. And it became very, it was very stable then. Is that dynamic or one-time thing? I, it just did just uh, one time. We set it in the factory, you know, with our we had you know our our clever. mounting plate. Yeah, that gives it an interesting question. Uh, a lot of our viewers and listeners uh, might be interested in some of the materials uh, involved. You know, we went from stainless steel uh, sliders and ball staking to ceramic and epoxy and ferrite and and then I believe. Uh, Thirty-three, forty was you carbide. Just, you're you're just going to steal my thunder, Bill. That's exactly where I'm headed. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so we made this this much smaller uh, uh, slider, and uh, uh, and I don't remember what 
initially what the material was that we designed, but we were having problems with wear, particularly with the, with the film discs. And uh, uh, the mechanical, mechanical integration group, uh, I told you, was doing burnish heads. They were doing um, glide height testing heads and things like that. And they were also doing uh, measuring uh, dynamic uh, uh, compliance, which they did with capacitance probes. But you can also do that with if you have a conductive slider, then you can look at the change in capacitance as the head is uh, flying. So they had a, a material that was, uh, that was actually a tool bit material. It, it was uh, titanium carbide and alumina mixed in, in 60, 40 or something like that uh, percentage. Extremely hard material, could be uh, made very flat, very dimensionally stable. And we were having tr this, this wear problems and very, I, th I think it was Chua Lin who suggested, why don't we try this material? Well, we, we looked at it, tried it, and it was, uh, um, it, 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 with, with a very short examination time, because they had had a lot of experience with it, we adopted this material, because it wore very well. We could, you know, the heads were wearing out, I mean, the disc were wearing out the heads, so if we're gonna get a head hard enough, it'll wear out the disc, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's, it wasn't really like that, but it, but it made a, also, this material had a very high modulus, so we could make it thin, so we didn't have to cut a notch in the back and put the suspension in, because we could make it very thin, which we wanted, because we wanted to make these little tiny sliders and get, get good yield for it. So this took, this all kind of worked together, make a smaller slider, harder slider, uh, uh, there's less mass being moved around, so that you get away with not having to put the push point at exactly the center of, of uh, mass of the, of the slider. Uh, we made the, the, the wires come straight down the center of the beam. Uh, so it, it, and it was, oh, uh, it, we elected to do because we had a thin aluminum arm. Uh, we elected to is, is put screws in and uh, which, uh, I think we should have worked harder and not to have the screws, but we, we used screws to mount on, on the arm. And, and uh, these arms for, for the 3380 had four heads per arm, same thing as the 3370 had, and the same thing as the, as the, as the Winchester had. Uh, and this was, uh, went into a very high performance um, uh, servo system in which the, the coil was part of, the, there were no bearings in the, on the moving mass, which is a big departure from what we had done before. And so the, it, the whole system became very sensitive to any resonances. So this was a, uh, uh, quite a good performing head suspension assembly for servos and, and, and has become uh, adopted in the industry you know, for, the, for the thin film heads. All, again, Channel integration was a major uh, piece of the of the puzzle. We spent uh, um, literally years optimizing the uh, the thin film head. Thin film head was started in in Yorktown, uh, by, and uh, transferred to San Jose. And it, Ian Kroll kind of managed the whole team, but but uh, uh, Bob Jones, Dr. Bob Jones. And uh, let's, there's another guy that said my. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll remember in a minute. Uh, we, uh, we're involved with with the actually the film. I worked for Ty Cowan, and he he pretty much let us do the head suspension assembly, all that work, and he focused at working with the thin film. Uh, line and the disc guys and and uh, um, working at at uh, kind of understanding and trying to make that whole system work. Now we never did make a film disc work that got through product test for the 3380. Uh, we we used a thicker disc that uh, that we were trying to do is is uh, reduce the flutter and. Uh, and we knew we wanted to do is have a family of 
products that went on beyond the, the, the 30, 3380. So uh, in the end, literally, uh, not before we had announced, but, but um, in the end we made a, a switch to um, an oxide. And that was really because of, of kind of some underground work that uh, uh, Jack Grogan and Andy Gaudet did and said, hey, we could make it and we could, we could have a, we, we could meet the magnetic performance and still have a, a, a reliable uh, product. Uh, kind of one other thing to, to mention about the, uh, uh, you can see with the tiny uh, thin film heads, uh, attaching wires uh, looked like it was going to be a, a challenge. But the, remember we had had uh, members of our uh, team had been part of a advanced computing system at Menlo Park and they had done a lot of work with uh, ultrasonic bonding, wire bonding. And so they, they had a technique of having a copper wire with, uh, that was gold plated on the outside and could do as uh, uh, ultrasonic bond that. So that's the technique we used to, to put the wires on. And uh, we actually could do that to the, to the flex cable uh, but although I think uh, they, they use soldering for uh, for a lot of that. Yeah. Well, that's something we did in a test room, the gold bonding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, these little bits of pieces of technology that were developed other places were kind of all brought together. Yeah. And and you can see one of the key things with, uh, with the, this bonding process is the bonder comes down, does a bond, comes away, but it always keeps control of the wire so it can be done automatically. So, yeah. so the wires never, you, know, you don't have to go fish for the wire. So uh, uh, af after the, uh, the 3380 uh, program, uh, I was uh, asked to go to do a tour of duty on the EP&T staff, that's Engineering Program and Technology, and work for uh, for Bob Evans, and and the, the that job was one of going around to all the IBM labs, and reviewing their plans, and IBM did two plans: a spring plan and a fall plan, and the, the labs would say, "Here's much, how much money we want to spend. Here's how many people we're going to hire, uh, and here's what we're going to work on. This is our products. This is our technology, etc." Then, the, the you know the high price help in Armon doesn't have any idea what that's all about. So they don't know whether to give them the money or not. So they have, they have a trusted guy in Bob Evans who has a staff who goes around and evaluates that. And so Bob selects technical people from, uh, from within the organizations. And we go around and view what's going on and, uh, uh, and then make comments. In you know, some cases, there might be five labs working on on uh, optical recording, when you say, "Well, the five labs are working on it, and each, you know, each has a few people. There's no critical mass. So what we should do is put a critical mass and move that to one of the other some lab, and we would usually recommend. But we say the other guys should should stop spending money on it, uh, and uh, that kind of thing. So that that was our goal. So we were we were kind of the black the black bag guys. You know, we'd come flying in from corporate, and they they would. Uh, and, and of course, one of the reasons you get sent back to do that is that it gives you a chance to see what the rest of the company is like. Yeah. You know that you get to see other labs, you get to meet lots of other people. You 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 know you you kind of get around. That was supposed to be a two-year assignment, and uh, I, I didn't last for the two years. I came back to uh, to San Jose, uh, and and became the the DASDI product manager, which I'll talk about in a minute. But, but there's a, one thing I think is kind of an interesting story is uh, the, company, the corporation was concerned about how is the Japanese, how are the Japanese doing? They seem to be, uh, we were worried that they were going to take a lot of business from us. So we wanted to understand what their, what they, what their capabilities were. So we had a, a uh, uh, we arranged to, to uh, with IBM Japan, arranged to have uh, exchange visits with uh, Fujitsu and NEC and Hitachi and, uh, and TDK. 
which we, which we did. And it was a, uh, a group made, made up of uh, Jack Harker and Dennis Mee and Lou Taft and myself and, uh, and a, another guy that, that was involved with the tape. And so we went to Japan to go visit these guys. And, and the first night we got there, uh, Lou Taft had been an assignment because he transferred tape from, uh, uh, from Sony to, to the Boulder plant. He had transferred that technology. So he knew his way around Japan. So the first night, he took, takes us out and teaches us how to be Japanese, you know, all the, the, the rules and the protocol and what to do and, you know, how to, how to do things so that we didn't stick out like sore thumbs. So, and kind of fortunately, he did that because the, the next day we, we got an airplane, uh, flew to, uh, airplane or, or, the, or the bullet train, I can't remember. But anyway, we went down to, uh, to the South Island and, and uh, visited T T D we were going to visit TDK. We got there at the uh, end of the day. By the way, we were always accompanied by an IBM and also U uh, IBM Japanese guy and uh, also uh, usually a company. Uh, guys would uh, accompany us. And <clears throat> we went out that first night, we went to dinner, they took us to dinner, and we had two servings in front of us, one American food and uh, Western food and another Japanese food. Well, Lou had told us, you know, be sure and eat the Japanese food. So we ate the Japanese food. And so uh, the next day we visited the TTK, TDK, did our, our our work. By the way, uh, I, I saw uh, their automatic line for making Winchester sliders. Uh, at that time, we brought the, the book I just showed you on right here, which had thin film heads and so forth. We brought that book along, and the Japanese were, that was like the best Christmas present they'd ever gotten because it showed us, showed them what we were doing and how we were doing it and, and so forth. Uh, the, uh, but that night, we went to the city, which I don't remember which city it was, uh, and we went down this little alley to go to dinner, and we went into this, and it looked like we were going to get mugged or something, but we went into this place, and there we had this a tea ceremony, a very elegant tea, tea ceremony, and then we went in to eat, and there was the, what her, the six of us, and then we also had six of the or, uh, TDK people. So we were on one side of the table, they were on the other side of the table. And there was a service, ladies dressed in kimonos and big hairdos for each one of us. So they prepared our, they poured, uh, you know, our drinks for us, anything that had to be prepared. We had a, we had a waiter, so to speak, for every, every individual. And it was, and it had course after course after course of things, you know, of all different kinds of, of stuff that I'd never even seen before. Yeah. But it was one of the most elegant dining experiences I ever had in my life. And it was very memorable. Anyway, the result of that whole thing was we learned that, that uh, uh, Japan had a, uh, a government organization, I think it was MITI. MITI, yeah. Yeah, that uh, was, uh, coordinating the technology efforts between uh, NEC, Hitachi, and Fujitsu. Right. So one guy would work on plated disc, one guy would work on, on thin field discs, one guy would work on, on particulate disc, one guy would work on this kind of thing, so forth. And then they, they shared their knowledge, and they also made a, a common file where they could test the, uh, uh, the results of that. So their government played a big role in orchestrating uh, and that's how they were keeping up with, with IBM, was by having this uh, coordinated effort between uh, the, the many companies. Anyway, uh, on, back, on to back to San Jose. I, I took on the, the role of, uh, of a product manager. And the product manager in IBM at that time had the, the planning and the revenue responsibilities for uh, uh, for the high-end DAS, for all of the DASDI products that were made in, in the division. Now, it's a, it, it is a, uh, it also included something like 600 to seven, 650 to 750 uh, engineers and other support people in that organization. 
So I, I had a, a, a big team of people and a whole new responsibility. Mm -hmm. and, and quite frankly, I was not very well prepared for it. Uh, I had never been in a customer's office as an IBM employee. I'd never met with a customer. And yet in this job, one of the first things that I had to do was go talk with problem customers and say, you know, they had a this problem or that problem, and I had to do is go talk with them and tell them what we were going to do and how, and, you know, how we were going to make it all better. And, and uh, I'm sure I, I must have made some really poor impressions on, on people because in some cases they were talking about control units that I didn't know anything about. Now, I'm a really relatively fast study, but it's still, I was thrown in over my head. And there were guys like Dick Whitney, if he hadn't have been there, I, I, I would have been completely lost because the whole planning process was one, of, uh, was one that I wasn't uh, familiar with. And this also, uh, uh, the, I should say, at this time, I think the, the revenue from the disk drives were, were running over $5 billion. That's oh, a big, huge. Yeah. enormous amount of money. And, and I'm supposed to have the profit and loss responsibility for that. Well, the truth is, that's way too much money for, for anybody. Well, I had lots and lots of corporate help and division help. And as a matter of fact, I, I could hardly do anything. I mean, <laughs> everything was, was dictated. Our division, uh, President Jack Bertram ran weekly meetings uh, on, on everything, on customer satisfaction and yields and, and, and et cetera. So it, it was, it was a, a job where you were given the responsibility, but you weren't able, you weren't. Yeah, I was gonna ask the question is, uh, if you had a ticked off customer, uh, what was your authority to solve this problem? Well, uh, it was probably pretty reasonable. I mean, I could, I could do some reasonable, uh, and, and mostly, the, everything was in the works anyway. I mean, I wasn't actually saying, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, as much as I was conveying to them as a, IBM executive, we, we care about you. Yeah. So uh, we did that. Uh, but, but one of the things that I, I kind of look forward to is that, is that uh, in this job, I was supposed to do the, uh, the planning for the next generations of products. And we had in the works right then, I think 3390 uh, had been kind of sketched out and it was gonna be, uh, it wasn't a 14 inch disc, but a, a, a 11 inch disc or thereabouts. Uh, and I, I ran a task force for over a year, and we met every, uh, every week, and I had the best minds in the, we had in the, in the area. And we looked at what kind of products should we be making, how could we make the systems perform better. We had, we had systems uh, uh, performance analysis by Curry Munz and his guys. Uh, there's, there's guys like uh, Jack Grogan, a guy by the name of Jim Gilmer worked on staff for me. I think it's probably the most frustrating year of his life because, I mean, he worked on this stuff and none of it got to see the light of the day. I mean, we weren't designing products, we were designing what were the specifications for it, what kind of, and, and we thought that a family of products, everywhere from, from large capacity to moderate capacity to really high, 16,000 RPM disc, for example, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, would, would be, uh, and that's what our modeling said would work. Uh, when I tried to present that to the corporation, it, it didn't fly. It, it, uh, uh, I couldn't sell it. And I was, I think it was my own, I blame myself for not being uh, you know, smart enough, uh, understanding enough, whatever it was. Uh, what were the objections? Was it too costly? Well, or one, of, one of the interesting thing, one of the objections was we have a whole big, bunch of buildings over here making 14 inch discs and what and we have a big investment in that now our product plans included improving the 3380 and making you know uh, 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 higher capacity drives and uh, but this was the 3380 didn't do a lot of things I mean it was it was a fantastic product it made billions of dollars for the for the corporation it ran for us, I don't know, 12 years or something like that. So, it, but it's like, what are you gonna do next? And, and I was convinced from the work we had done that making a, a, a raise, you know, a, a, a raid, you know, a raise of, of uh, 
inexpensive uh, drives was the way to go. A 3380, depending on its configuration, but it's, it, it, it ran around $120,000. And that was for two and a half gigabytes. Two and a half gigabytes. I mean, that's just nothing. And By today's standards, yeah. And, and it was a very complex drive to build, very expensive drive to build. And guys were making, on the outside, were making, using uh, IBM technology, but small form factor drives for, you know, a fraction of the cost that we were making. I mean, I, I, I think we had a session and Jim Lucky had a bearing. I said, well, my Micropolis my made the whole drive, castings, motors, actuated the whole thing for the cost of that bearing. I mean, it, it was, there was just no comparison. And I thought that IBM was going on the wrong track. So, well, well, now Hersley had, had made a small form factor uh, drive. Uh, like eight inch yeah, or something. yeah. Now there are, there are there are complications to all this that I'm talking about, having to do with uh, count key data versus fixed block architecture, which I'm not going to get into here because it's. But but we had boxed ourselves in with with uh, count key data formats that limited a lot of stuff that we could do. But anyway, the 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 uh, uh, probably out of this, if I was going to tell a story, is, is we were going to do an enhancement to the 33. Uh, 80, and we wanted to do a double density, and we'd been having, a, you know, uh, problems with stiction and, and other things, and so we we got the, the team together and went down to Car uh, Carmel, and got 50 or 60 people down there, and we actually, each of the, the head guys, the disc guys, the channel guys, everybody, can you do your part of making this? and. And basically, they said, "Well, I, I might be able to do my part, but I'm not. I don't think this guy can do his." <laughs> and it, it was so. We spent two days, and and uh, we agreed to go back. Uh, I agreed to go back and, and present a one and a half times, which I know was going to be, you know, I, I was, people were not going to be happy with that. They wanted it two times, but we agreed that we would meet sometime later, and people went in earnest, looked at what they could do to do their part of it. And whatever it was, four or six months later, we met and we agreed to do the two times. But it's one of those cases where, where guys had all been beat up and they, and they, they uh, didn't want to commit to something they weren't sure they could make because they knew what would happen if they didn't. So uh, here's a case of letting them, some, giving them some time to work, hold the, hold the powers that be at bay for a, for a few months, and we, we came up with a with uh, with a new program, so but I, that's probably one of the highlights of that of that period of time. Uh, I became so frustrated uh, uh, with where we were going that I decided that I was going to uh, uh, leave the company. I said, I don't think we're going in the right direction, so I'm going to go do something else. And if you remember, Bill, there, you know most of the time, uh, headhunters had. Uh, uh, orga organization chart for IBM, and we were oh, called yeah. all the time. I mean, we were there, was, and I always said, no, no, I'm not, not uh, interested. A couple of times I, I talk with people more than just hang up the phone. But at this time, then I was ready to go. And so somebody approached me about taking an, an engineering job as the VP of engineering at Micropolis. Before we leave IBM, how had the culture changed over the, you, you're there 20 years, so you have a long history there. You know, the, it's interesting. The San Jose culture didn't change uh, so much. It changed a bit when Jack Bertrand came because he brought some East Coast culture. When I went on EPT staff, I found that the East Coast IBM was very different than the West Coast IBM. In what way? In that, in the East Coast, you know, their way of speaking is um, they're um, they're more conf confrontational. They they shoot barbs at each other. They're more protective of their of their territory. It's it is a in the in the San Jose world. Remember, we had a we program where we worked together. And in in the uh, in the East, I don't think they would have ever had a we we program. So it was a, a much much more co cooperation. And we had guys like uh, you know Ken Houghton and, and uh, Jack Harker and Dennis Me and guys like that who were who were. Uh, 
managers and leaders, Jerry Harry's, although Jerry Harry was pretty, was pretty confrontational, but we had uh, people that uh, oh, I, I think that by example, uh, we lived a different life. We didn't live in fear of our jobs or whatever. So as you moved up in, in the ranks of IBM, I guess it became more Eastern oriented, more confrontational. Yeah, there, there was more of that, yeah. But, but I, I, I think it was still, uh, you know, a very, good, a very good place. Oh, wonderful yeah. place. But uh, yeah. anyway, you, 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 so uh, Headhunter uh, got a hold of you and, you and you took the job. I took the job, Micropolis. And by the way, I, I loved the job. It was, it was a great, I loved the job. It was a great job we were making. Uh, I had joined, they were making a, a half eye, five and a quarter that was very successful. They had- This is Micropolis now. Micropolis. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, they were selling to Deck and to uh, other people. They, they uh, uh, one of the things that, that Stu Mabon, who was the president, and, uh, and Eric Dunstan, who was one, also one of the founders, but who, who was kind of technical, uh, guru at large, a very, very smart guy who knew everything about everything. And I mean, in, seriously. Yeah, I think I met him once. Yeah, he, he's a, a very good guy. And Stu was also. Uh, Ed Hecox was there, F, had been joined from IBM as the manufacturing manager. Uh, and, and Stu wanted to make some more products, but he didn't have his engineer, he had, I think, like 35 people on his engineering team. Now remember, IBM did machines with hundreds of people, hundreds of people, and here they have a, a, a engineering. Their total engineering staff was like 35. So one of my jobs was to de help define the next products. But Stu was was quite good at that. He knew what he what he needed for the marketplace, and it was to go and hire people. And so I, in the relatively short time I was there at at, uh, at uh, Micropolis. I, year and a half or something like that. Uh, I hired, uh, took the engineering staff to over 100. And uh, I personally was actively involved in a lot of the hires. The, uh, uh, I took them to, you know, the special ones, I took to dinner, I talked with them. Uh, and, and part of that was so that there wasn't as much burden on the, on the guys who were doing the work. Uh, obviously, if somebody's going to join this guy's organization or not, they, they talk with him. Uh, did that, and the uh, and I, I also like that you were I was part of everything. I mean, I was there at the uh, uh, the board meetings. Uh, I was there at the at uh, you know the executive staff meetings. We went to trade shows. I met with customers. I went on sales calls. Uh, and when I look back, I say, how, how could I get all that stuff done in that time? But it was, it was fun, it was very busy, and, uh, and uh, uh, I cared a lot about it. Now their approach at, at, uh, Max, at uh, uh, Micropolis was to use vendor technology for heads, media, chips, and then internally they would design the castings, uh, the the uh, actuators, the motors, uh, you know, the, uh, all the various, uh, uh, the, the PC boards, so forth. They, they designed that. But they did not try to do any of the, quote, technology work. That was purchased from, from, uh, from the outside. So we bought chips from, for rewrite channels, chips for the, mm -hmm. for the SCSI interface, chips. We, we bought yeah, In those days, a, a lot of industry had grown up. Uh, I remember AMC and uh, various people were making Yeah, Infomag and you know other, other people were making and all the disc makers that were going on, right? Yeah. yeah. There were several of those. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and I probably would have stayed there but uh, two things happened. Jim McCoy somehow decided that he wanted me to work for him. I worked with Jim at IBM. Oh, okay. And and so he knew me personally. And uh, and I also had a, a house in San Jose that hadn't sold. And I was making terrible house payments, so I was in. A, so uh, he offered me a way out, and and uh, of of my financial situation. And then uh, I I think I mentioned Jack Schwartz. Jack Schwartz was one of the founders of of, uh, 
of uh, MaxStore. And Jack had been the engineering VP, and, and Jack either didn't want to or whatever uh, continue in that job, and he was in favor of my coming. So he, he uh, uh, so it was smooth from that standpoint. So Jack was gonna work on the side and do some advanced tech work and things like that. And then I joined, uh, I, I joined MaxStore. And there was a, a good team of people, a stronger management team. There was uh, Bill Dobbin for financial and, and uh, uh, Steve Katroser for manufacturing and- Melnad. Yeah, Leon Melnad and, and the sales marketing, and our sales and marketing guy slipped my brain. But, but anyway, uh, work, we worked uh, very well together. Jim is a good team leader. And uh, so I set about defining some new products and, uh, and then hiring people, the same thing. I hired uh, well over 100 people uh, at uh, probably closer to 200 people all in all into, uh, into MaxStore. And many of those, I mean, I hired you, right? Yeah, you sure did. <laughs> and, and Ron Dennison and... and Jack... Uh, uh, Osborne, yeah, Jack Osborne, and yeah, a, a, a bunch of really good guys. Really good, good people. Good, good, solid team of, of people at at, uh, at MaxStore, and we continued to increase the capacity. They were they were in production, making a full high five and a quarter, eight disc stack, and we increased the the capacity of that. We did um, a, th a uh, three and a half inch drive, I think a two and a half inch drive, of uh, a number of, of of products for it, and uh, all. then one of the people I hired uh, kind of went, tried to shoot me down, and he succeeded. <laughs> oh. And so uh, I, I was terminated from from Maxstore by a relatively new president. We brought in another guy to run. Jim th thought the company was growing so much it was that he wanted to have a. A more professional manager come in, and we did, and then I was terminated, and I. Well, who took over? Well, that, I mean, who, afterwards, actually, yeah. I don't know who took over my job. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the questions I had was, how did the relationship go with you and Jack? Uh, here's the founder who now works for a, a newcomer. Uh, he's a very creative guy. He was pushing glass discs and thin film oh, heads, and it, it, we got along great, absolutely but, great. Yeah, I thought I mean, you did. Yeah, we did. We were friends at IBM. Uh, we. Oh, Jack was IBM as well. Yeah, Jack came from IBM. He 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 was the guy who got the uh, the preamp and uh, diode matrix put on the on the thirty three fifty and thirty three seventy. Oh, uh, okay. Arms. Didn't know that. Yeah, no. You know, good engineer, and uh, Jack and I actually had one time talked about going out and starting a company. Okay. You know, so we, we were that kind of friends. <laughs> You know, in our in our youth, you know, early on. Uh, anyway, so that that went that part went uh, went quite well. And the uh, I, I don't know if you remember, Bill. I I uh, introduced a matrix organization. Yes, remember that. And the re the reason for that is because as, as we were grow growing, we didn't have we weren't hiring people to balance. Uh, you know, we we had a, a product team making a three and a half, another product team doing advanced, you know, high capacity. Uh, full high dry, another team doing something else, and and uh, and we only had a few experts in read write channels or a few experts on there. So by having a matrix, we could do is assign one person, and you get the support all those, and you could could support all those. And uh, anyway, I I think it probably was just semi successful. I I went from most of the people who were used to being dedicated on a product and and to share any time was a. Uh, was a problem was a problem but uh, some people worked well with it I, I think you were one of the guys who worked well with it I think yeah, you were responsible for heads in media and uh, so forth so so uh, uh, well, actually at that time I think uh, uh, your mentor uh, uh, the founder of Max store Jim McGoy Jim had decided to leave the company well he he was on the board yeah he's he was not there on a day-to-day -day basis and I, I'm positive, I mean, I know this for sure, that it, if he had been president, I would, would have still been there. So I don't know what all the reasons for, uh, for not being there. But one of the things before I, I left uh, 
Max Dorr, I, Priam had gone, uh, declared bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And I was assigned to go over with a couple other guys and evaluate what they had. And they had a five and a quarter full height and they had a, a, a three and a half inch drive that they had completed, had the tooling for. It was, they were operational. And I looked there and I said, these are pretty good designs. I said, I th for not very much money, we could take them out of the marketplace. Just buy it, we, and uh, and I made that recommend recommendation to uh, to our the president, and and he said no no they wouldn't do that. Who was the president at that time? Scalise. Yeah. We did buy uh, uh, Mini Scribe. I remember that. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> that got us into the three and a half inch. Yeah. Well. We, yeah, we had some. We had our own designs, but we we wound up with mini scrap. But anyway, to make a long story short, I, I was involved with that evaluation of of, of mini scrap of, of mini scribe, but of Priam. So when I left, I actually went over and bought the Priam designs uh, myself. I bought them out of out of uh, bankruptcy, so I bought the designs, all of their lab equipment, their oscilloscopes and things like that, all the tooling for these two new new drives, clean benches, things like that. And uh, paid some cash and and some uh, and some on a on a, a note that if I if we made it successful they would get this for it mm -hmm. and uh, and that was the beginning of Orca right and uh, I had met Dick Reiser before but Dick Reiser was their uh, had been their VP of engineering also the VP of sales and marketing and I kind of switched back and forth and sometimes both at the same time so Dick and I got along quite well and then we. Met another guy, uh, Juan Gilcho, who was a financial guy who had who had done business in Korea and Taiwan and and Japan and so forth. So he, the three of us, formed Orca, and uh, we rented a building, moved all the stuff in, set up shop, started hiring people, and then the fun began. And that was raising money, and our our business plan, unlike uh, Max Store and Micropolis who did all their work and then manufactured themselves. M Micropolis manufactured their drives initially in, in Chatsworth and then in, in uh, Singapore. Max did the same thing and set up a Singapore uh, line. Uh, our strategy was to uh, complete the design and testing of the drive, but to have a contract man manufactured in some place like Korea or Taiwan uh, Japan, and there were people at that time who were, who were interested in doing that, and it's a model that was uh, was executed successfully by Quantum uh, to do that. So we set up trying to find uh, manufacturing partners, and I traveled all over the place, uh, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, visited all sorts of people. In the end, we got two deals in, in Taiwan. Two, two companies actually uh, signed up, one to make three and a half, the other to make five and a quarter. And, and uh, they actually made some five and quarters that they shipped to us. But in the end, both collapsed. And now, why is not completely clear. Uh, I also got uh, the, the Iron Curtain had fallen, and there were some, quote, opportunities in, in Europe. And we met a guy by Mr. Dimitrov, who came and joined us, and he got some investors from Europe, and uh, he he came from Bulgaria, and there was a factory in uh, Bulgaria, DZU, that was empty. This is the rocket plant or something? No, no, it, it was it was a disk drive plant, and then there was a uh, there was another in East Germany, there was another one in Austria. There, I mean, there there's all kinds of stuff going on, so I went to talk with these people. And, uh, in, and one of the more interesting things was going to DZU in Bulgaria. And here was, on one side of the parking lot, was a great big barracks of housing. <coughs> one end was kind of a, a hall and, and kind of corporate offices. <coughs> the other side was a big manufacturing multi-story uh, building. And inside of that, they made, um, uh, 2314s and, and uh, 3350s and uh, 33, uh, I don't know if think they had made 3380s yet, but they had made uh, a whole pile of IBM uh, drives 
and they made them exact copies. I mean, to I mean, one of the base plates I think on the, on the 3350, uh, there was a hole. There was a hole for a reason that we no longer needed it, and we didn't make a change. They put that same hole. There's no reason for that hole. They shouldn't. <laughs> it, it, it was. I mean, they and they they said they were exact copies, and they made them for the. Uh, for the, the communist bloc. They provided these the, uh, uh, to, to Russia and to, to all of the, the communist nation, uh, nations. They had a ferrite headline uh, where they, were, they made their own ferrite, machined it. They had a motor plant, not, not right there in Star Zagora, but uh, a few miles away. Uh, they had uh, uh, all kinds of clean rooms. They did, they had an enormous uh, machine shop. I actually took, I had a, one of these little cameras that you get, uh, uh, you know, box cameras, paper throwaway, you know, they use at weddings and things like that. Uh, I purchased one of those at the airport before I went in. Now this was a very scary experience. I walked in, this is, I'm going, quote, behind the old iron current. First thing they do is take my passport away. Then there's a guy there, a driver, to meet me. And he drives me for miles. And we visit uh, a floppy disk plant. We visit a a, uh, uh, a card plant, and then we go further. And I drive out to this lodge. There's a lodge, and there's a man and a woman, and the driver and myself, in this great big lodge. They fix dinner, and I go sleep in a little upstairs room. And the when I say little upstairs room, and then it had a bathroom, and the bathroom. It had like a shower up here, and, and it sprayed the whole room. I mean, so it, <laughs> the shower and the bathroom, the whole thing was like, uh, you know, a uh, foot and a half or two feet by two feet square. Wow. I mean, very, very primitive uh, arrangement. And next day we, we go to the plant. I'm toured through and showed everything. I was taking pictures. I took pictures of, of uh, of their lines and their machine capability, machining capabilities, and so forth. And it's clear that they, you know, that that this factory needed to have something. They, they were about ready to, to go under, and we, and and our uh, gigabyte capacity or uh, eight disk prime drive would have been great for there. So that that trip, by the way, I got back. We stopped for something, petrol or something along the way, and I went into to their little, you know, the, the store. The shelves were empty. I mean, there was a couple of pieces of vegetables, and that's it. And guys standing around with nothing to do. It was, it was, you know, the country was in dire straits. It was, um, and later on, I visited the, the ambassador to England who came from Bulgaria. Uh, I visited the, the his office in, in uh, London, and uh, we were trying to put some sort of a quote deal together. Uh, also, there was a factory in East Germany that had been uh, making uh, five and a quarter uh, half high drives. It was it was based on a design done in San Jose that was transferred to uh, I think Taiwan or or uh, I think. Taiwan or Hong Kong some at first, and then it made its way over. So it was being made there in this in this factory, and these guys would like wanted us to buy their factory. They would give us the factory, the buildings, the st everything. Uh, they had something like 1,300 employees, and if we would do is move a uh, disk drive uh, production there, and the uh, and it was fascinating because they had. Enormous clean rooms. They had a whole liquid nitrogen factory in the back that it cost more to make it in their factory than it did to buy it from West Germany and truck it in. I mean, for example, they had an enormous machine shop. They were making uh, disk drives, but they had on site of this place, they had their own uh, fire engines, their own police department, their own hospital, their own cafeteria. Uh, security guards. They had row after row of, of rooms uh, that were probably uh, 
20 by 12, something like that, with a big heavy door in the front. And you go in a door and there was, had a post in the middle and a little table and a coffee pot. And that room may have rope in it. And then you go to the next room and it would have plastic uh, pipe fittings. You go to the next room and it would have metal pipe. And then the next one was locked up because it was full of guns. And then, <laughs> and, then and so forth. <coughs> it was, it was the, the guys would joke and they says, you know, this is communism. We pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. That's, that was what, they had some very good uh, scientists there working um, on, on their, on tribology and things like that. They had an electron microscope that was probably 20 feet high. Oh my. It, I mean, it was back from, I don't know when, the 30s or something. It, I mean, it had, uh, so they had very little modern instrumentation, but they were smart, and they, they, did, they did good work. Anyway, <clears throat> with all these kind of deals going on, and, uh, and our German and, uh, and English and, and Irish investors, and Bisser, uh, uh, were, wanted to do things in, in Europe and not in Asia. And I had arranged for loans from, or, or for investments from Hitachi and from other people. All of a sudden, I found out later, they got calls that said, don't do it, don't do it. And so the, uh, our investors put us, you know, forced myself out. And within days, they put the company into bankruptcy. And then people from Bulgaria came over to start collecting documents and tools and things like that. Before the sheriff, just before the sheriff put the lock on the door, they moved all the equipment out into trucks and took it to Fremont. Later they found it and, uh, and uh, they had an auction. I went to the auction to see all my stuff being auctioned off. <laughs> well, what, what, what turned the investors sour on, uh, on these deals? I, well, I don't know that they were sour on the deal. I think that they, that they were trying to, to put them together and they just figured they didn't need the San Jose operation. And, and uh, oh, we, we were not in good financial shape. I mean, we needed to have, uh, the, the production wasn't coming as it was supposed to from Taiwan. And uh, I think the Taiwanese were worried about what was going on within the company. And so there, it, it just, uh, in hindsight, it probably it would have been much better not to have, have done any deals in, in uh, Europe and just hmm. continued on with the other ones. If you'd focused on Asia, do you think the investors would have been uh, more Inclined? Well, we would have had Asian investors and not European yeah. investors. Yeah. yeah, they understand their own territory. Yeah. Oh, and I, tra I traveled all over and the, the place talking with people and you know trying to put deals together here and there. Uh, that was very. It was a lot of hard work, very frustrating, uh, and in the end, it wound up for none. So after I was forced out, then I did a project with. Uh, with uh, Gibbs Springer to make a very small form factor, one inch disk drive. Yeah. And we had a, he had a technique for making a very flat disk. And uh, uh, we worked on a design for that. The problem was we couldn't fit the electronics in. We could make the disk enclosure and uh, the flat motor and, and so forth, but we couldn't fit the electronics. And so I was offered a job at Toshiba um, uh, as a VP of engineer, mm -hmm. so I went went over there, trying to help get the production up and the yields up and so forth. Uh, and not long or afterwards, well, you and I worked together at at, uh, at Toshiba, right? Yeah. And uh, that was I think Ron Dennison also. Interesting experience too. Uh, there you got to work for a, a Japanese owner. We worked for a Japanese owner, and it became pretty clear that the the uh, T Toshiba had a factory in San Jose and was making things so that they could learn everything they could about the technology. Toshiba was very active in laptops. Uh, they weren't part of the in companies in Japan as far as the technology, you know, so they were left off of the, of the list. And they needed uh, low cost, uh, small form factor drives for their, for, their, uh, for their laptops. Now this first drive that we were, we were building in San Jose was a three and a half inch. And uh, everything was very carefully, all the copies of all the documents, reports, and things like that was uh, 
it was carefully sent back to Japan. And not wasn't that long after I joined, less than a year, they, uh, they decided to close down the, the San Jose factory. And I stayed on to close it down. I yeah, mean, I remember that, yeah. yeah I mean, to literally uh, lock the doors, uh, you know, hold an auction and... and uh, As I recall, part of the story was that uh, Toshiba America is the one who really wanted a three and a half because they had a market for it, but Japan was uh, only interested in their laptop stuff. I, I, Bill, I think that's true. And I think the reason Toshiba uh, parent company uh, went along with it is because they knew that they were going to get something out of it. I mean, they are going to get the, the testing, the design, the experience, you know, how to, you know, not that they didn't know how to do stuff themselves, but they got, they tapped into what was the latest stuff that was going in San Jose. They learned, you know, who would be, who were suppliers, what technology to use, uh, that kind of stuff. So it, it, it is a, and, th and then when I, uh, Finished up with uh, with Toshiba. Uh, I was going to work with Gib on making this the small form factor, and I stumbled on to these guys that were making uh, um, semiconductor packaging that was chip scale, and that was uh, Tessera. Yeah. Well, before you leave that, uh, so Gib Springer. Now he had a company called Markland, and they were trying to make a. Uh, in fact, they did make a one in show. I don't know whether it was before IBM did it or after. I, I don't know for sure either, but I was not part of that. You didn't work on that one. No, okay. I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't work on that. And uh, but when I when I left Toshiba, I was went to look for uh, the electronics to go with a with a one-inch drive. And I think that was before Marklin, if I but I may be wrong. But I think that was true. And uh, so how uh, how did you bump into Tesla? What how did you do well, that? Well. Um, Dr. Kong was a guy was a guy that I was introduced to by Juan Gil Cho, who was you know our financial guy, and and he was kind of he had a couple of companies and did all kinds of stuff around, uh, and I helped him consult on a few a few things, and he did consulting like for Gusik and for other other people, and the. Uh, and he had gone to a wedding at, for uh, the financial lady at Tessera. And at that wedding, he had met Tom uh, and John, Tom DiStefano and John Smith. And so he said, hey, you know, you're looking for this, so you should go talk with him. Well, we did. And John said, you know, it's really tough time in the disk drive market right now. And we're growing, and we think we've got the world by the tail with our, with our chip scale packaging. And he said, uh, we need somebody to make some products for us so that we can demonstrate our capability. And I think his mind, we were, we were going to go make products, which I never did. I joined them, and one of the first jobs I went, went to the com computer show and started showing people these chip scale packages and things they were People are starting to now do computers that would fit on your belt and do mobile devices. And so, and they, they had the same problem that we had. You couldn't fit the electronics in. You might, you might stop for a second and, and explain what is a chip scale package for the audience? Okay, sure, sure. Uh, you know, if you, if you looked at, at an old television set or, or radio, things like that, you'd see these little black packages with these kind of little spider legs sticking out. Well, those are regular. Inside of that would be a little piece of, of silicon, and it would be uh, that that's what does all the work. And all these legs and plastic and stuff like that were to be able to get the signals out and attach, and so it could attach to a to a, a printed circuit board. Now, the coefficient of therm thermal expansion of a piece of silicon is it's very nonlinear, but it's around three to four parts per million per degree centigrade, and and PC boards are about 18 parts per million per degree centigrade. So whenever you try to put a chip by itself onto a PC board and it would go through a temperature cycle, something had to give. And usually the joints would have to give. So uh, if you tried to make a, a package the same size as, as, the, uh, uh, as the die, and people had done that. Actually, IBM had a C4 process where they put lead balls underneath and mounted to ceramic, which is, has a lower coefficient of thermal expansion. 
and the lead balls were soft enough that as it heated and cooled, that it would uh, that the, the lead would would act as a be be compliant. And the so Tessera had figured out a way to put uh, at that time they were putting uh, nickel bumps on polyam and tape, and then had leads inside. So in this case, as the board would expand, solder balls attached to the board, and that went to leads, and then those are bonded to the chip. So the chip's moving like this, the board is looking like that, and these leads are busy uh, moving around. Then they put an elastomeric layer in between that, uh, that uh, uh, would accommodate those stresses. And they did that for little die and big die and, and uh, great big die and so forth. Uh, and it was uh, they were they were working with Sun and and uh, uh, Texas Instrument and a few people Intel, like yeah, yeah and, and later on they worked for, for Intel. Uh, but the the Tessera model was to develop the processes and the technology and then license it and get a royalty. That was their model. They knew they could. It was way too. Uh, a packaging business by itself is a low margin business. It's been done in offshore, it's done in Korea and places like that where they ship them dyes and they, they package them and send them back to you. And uh, I think at that, when I joined, they had licensed uh, Shinko as a, as a uh, tape supplier and, and uh, Shindo and uh, Hitachi for, uh, for uh, packaging uh, technology and so forth. So they had a few licenses and they had trained people. But when I, when I went to the trade show and talked with people, it was clear that we needed to do is talk with enough detail that we could provide a solution for somebody. So if somebody says, hey, I, I, I can't make my device because I can't fit everything uh, in here, then we would come along and say, give us a chance to put it in a chip scale package. So we, that's what we did, and that's what I did. I traveled around, all, literally all over the, the world initially mostly my, by myself. If it was a potential licensee, then, then usually Tom DiStefano would come. Later on, when we did military work, uh, uh, John Riley and I would, would go and teach people about the technology and, and solve their problem. I would come back with a, with a die layout and, uh, and give it to, to uh, Gibson, and he would, and we would work out the lead stuff, then make prototypes on our on our line, provide them to the to the companies, so they could so they could temp evaluate. Uh, probably you mentioned something that was uh, uh, Intel was really the breakthrough for us, I and mean, that's because in, Intel met us at a trade show, and uh, there was they uh, they were selling bare die to people. But to do sell a bare die, they had to do is probe all of the pads. Well, the probes would scar the pads, and so the end user had to do wire bonding onto it, and he would have failures at those scars. So they wanted a package so that it would be the same size as the die, not any bigger, and, but it would be testable, and we had these bumps so you could test it, and they that was gonna be their solution for their bare die. Well, we licensed it, and they started, um, uh, preparing, they, were, they set up a line in, in uh, initially in uh, over by Sacramento, uh, Folsom. There, Folsom, yeah, a line there, and then and then in, in the Philippines. But somebody came along and and uh, they needed uh, die um, flash memory. Flash memory was used in cell phones, so it was a very high volume market, and. Uh, Flash memory die is a big die, relatively speaking. If you open a, a, a phone up, it would be one a of the larger. Millimeters. Or what was big die mean? Uh, yeah, you know they they were three eighths of an inch or so, and they would go through die shrinks and things like that. But they're 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 not teeny tiny die. Uh, but they're not they're not processors die. But they all uh, and. Uh, they were having failure problems because people would drop a phone. Remember in the old days you drop your phone, it was dead? It's all over. It's all over. Well, one of the reasons for that is because the, the, the dye that was in a plastic on the lead, on leads had enough inertia when it hit, when the phone would hit the deck, it would have create a failure. Well, it turns out with a, with a, with a 
Tessera type with this compliant layer, it's like it's the dye is mounted on rubber. Also, you don't have all the plastic around it, and you can make a very thin dye, and you can make a ball so it takes much spa less space. And it turned out to be super reliable. It probably wasn't cheaper, but it was, it was, uh, it really, the phone companies loved it. And I mean, we've literally, uh, uh, I, I think that Intel like had 30% of the flash memory die in the phone business before micro BJ and, and within two years they had 70%. They just beat everybody out. <laughs> Good deal for them. Because it was, it was a much better solution. And uh, oh, so we did many die, they put in factories, they had, uh, they had uh, uh, Amcor and uh, uh, Mitsui High Tech and a few others that we that put in uh, lines. Uh, they did an interesting thing in this in that they, we had gold leads and that was hard to source, but they got uh, Hitachi Cable and uh, Shinko and a few others to do copper plated leads that were, I mean copper leads that were gold plated. So they could do the, their ultrasonic bond on their, uh, and these were ribbons, so they would, ultrasonic bond would come down and do uh, uh, ultrasonic bond. Was the objective cost? Cost and availability. Yeah, and they 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 didn't uh, didn't have any reliability uh, problems with it. You may remember, Bill, that we we did a, a bunch of stuff for the uh, military uh, with with this technology, and they did uh, uh, one of the the tests. They wanted to make sure that these were going to go into uh, uh, smart. Uh, smart shells and smart uh, oh, rockets and smart yeah. things yeah, like that. And stuff. Yeah, smart mortars and you know where the wings would come out and they'd steer them and so forth. But they wanted to see whether these would work or not. So we we built a uh, uh, a thing the size of a, of a mortar shell to fit in a tank barrel and mounted uh, micro BGAs in in different patterns. You know, sideways, crossways, mm -hmm. so forth front ways, back ways, and then we'd, they'd shoot them from a cannon into straw, bar straw bales and see if they survived. And they all, they, they all survived. So you can shoot micro BGAs out of cannons. <laughs> That's pretty good. We also put it in ears. There were some projects oh, on the yes. cochlear implant. Cochlear implant was an interesting one. And that's uh, somebody came to us from Australia that did ear implants and the cochlear. And they, they embed the chips, and they have to last for the lifetime of, they usually do it with children. It doesn't have to be with children, but oftentimes. Then it has to li last the lifetime of the child. So they were interested in the gold lead uh, version of it. And so that, that was an application, a medical application. Another one was uh, uh, in pacemakers. Uh, we had Medtronic come to us and said, we have this new version. We know by the time it's going to be in production, we're going to get, get uh, this capacity in our member, but we don't have it now, but we need it. Can you package uh, dye in the same place? And, and we came up with a foldover. If you remember that, we had two dye side by side, and we'd fold it this way, and the balls would be on the bottom. So you actually, in one footprint, were connected. To, yeah, connected uh, 3D to, stuff. Yeah. Then we did 3D packaging with uh, systems in a package. We had designs for a whole radio. Uh, in, in a single patch package that we did uh, lots of really interesting. How, how hard was it to switch <clears throat> from a career in hard drive technology to something sort of alien, uh, uh, electronic packaging? <laughs> you know, I, I, um, there's a little learning curve, but I didn't think, think it was that hard. There's lots of material stuff. There was pro chemical that you're familiar, pro familiar yeah, with, yeah. materials. Electronics. There's a lot of, of uh, processing. Uh, you know, we made the tape in San Jose, that, so I worked with polyamide tapes for cables for, for heads. Uh, so it, it, I didn't think it was, it was, uh, it was that hard. Uh, and a lot of the job was selling the industry on this, that this technology was going to be viable and that it was going to last and that they should license it. And uh, yeah, they had a demo line and they had yeah. uh, Well, I remember you did, 
cost models for us for really elaborate um, Excel spreadsheets with all different kinds of parameters that we, we uh, so we could demonstrate to people that they could actually make it in, uh, in volume and at a reasonable cost. And we put a line in, in Singapore to demonstrate the same thing. So interesting enough, it's a catch-22. If you don't make it, and a bunch of them, then they don't believe you, you can make it and what the costs are going to be. As soon as you make it, then they say you're a competitor. <laughs> so, so they said, why do we want to compete with you guys? You're the inventors. You know all about it. And we say, no, 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 no. This is as big as it will ever be. This is, you know, go look at the building. You can't make it any bigger. Then I guess Torsher changed. They, they went into optics and uh, decided not to do medical stuff and so on and so on. Uh, the culture changed and I guess the management changed and then you left. Yeah, and, and I haven't stayed that close with it. Uh, I still see IBMers because we have lunch every, you know, twice a year and maybe 50 or 60 guys come from the old, uh, from the old IBM days. Uh, I don't see anybody from uh, Micropolis. I have dinner with Jim McCoy at least once a year. Uh, I, the uh, Tessera, I, Craig Mitchell, one of the guys that, that worked there was, uh, uh, Lori and I are godparents to a couple of their kids, yeah. and uh, but uh, he's still there. Yeah, he's still there. So I, I'm, I, I'm not a very strong. I don't go back and make keep strong ties. You know. Okay. I, okay. Now, if you had it to do all over again, uh, would you do it differently? Different career? Or? No, I I actually, Bill, I think. I was really fortunate to be involved with two technologies that I think made a big difference to the world. Me too. Yeah. I think doing the hard disk technology work had such an impact, you know, of computers, PCs, all the stuff that, that, that went on. And I'm fortunate enough to work for IBM who had enough money to do all of that and, uh, and, sure. and sure. to make contributions. And the next thing, what do we carry around? You know, we carry around phones and, and oh, cameras and all this stuff and chip scale packaging largely made that possible and to make it reliable so that you can carry it around and drop it and not break it, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Well, downstairs uh, they have, a, 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 I guess, a replica of the electronics for the moonshot, wires all over the place. You probably have more power in your cell phone than... Oh, much more. <laughs> than they had. There's, I have much more power in my cell phone than the, than the uh, computer that, that uh, we did the air bearing uh, programs on. Yeah, it's amazing. So I feel very fortunate about being able to having worked in that. In that, what's your vision of the future for these technologies? What do you think is going to happen with drives and and uh, packaging? Well, uh, we'll see whether semiconductors knock drives out eventually, but the drives keep coming up with high, higher and higher aerial densities. Oh, it's incredible! Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just it, it's it's amazing, and. Uh, we could have talked about some of those technologies, but we, obviously we don't have time for that. And I, and I have not been intimately invo involved, other than the beginnings of the MR heads, and and uh, uh, self-loading sliders. You know, but uh, and I think the packaging is the same way. It'll keep going. Uh, more and more capacity. Probably the, the limitations is, is the heat, and uh, and a few things like that. But even the, their solutions. You know, we had patents in Tessera to, to, to fix those. So I think there's a lot of growth ahead yeah, for, for both agree. of them. Yeah. The only question in my mind is reliability. As you, as you get down to where just a few electrons maybe are storing your data, is, <laughs> is, is, is that the most reliable situation? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. Well, they'll, they'll have redundancy or, or other, some other things or, uh, to make it all happen. After your career in technology, you got into the arts and uh, you're building a house and a little about that maybe. Uh, just, yeah, just quickly. Uh, uh, I was worried when I retired that, and I retired because I wanted to do more other things. And actually, I wanted to go sailing. I, I was planning to do is go sailing around yeah, the world. You bought a boat and everything. Yeah, I, well, I, I, I owned a boat and uh, I actually did sail on a race from San Francisco to Hawaii in the Pack Cup race, so I've had that experience of crossing the, uh, the water. Uh, my wife has had uh, uh, bad knees, so she, she doesn't 
liked to sail uh, very much. And, and uh, while I had a boat built, it never was delivered. It's still in Costa Rica. <laughs> a long, sad story, but, but nevertheless. So uh, the, the, we had a partnership later on with our boat, and the people have now purchased it. And next month, they're going to take off and head to on the Baja Haha to, to, southern, to south of Mexico, and then they're going to go across the, the Pacific. So uh, that was my plan, so I was going to do that, but I didn't. Then we I've done a lot of home remodeling and rebuilding. We, we did a place in Willow Glen, and then we downsized to a, to a house in, uh, in Morgan Hill, and now I'm doing it all over again. So I'm, I'm, the, gen I'm the general contractor on... Uh, Is that fun? Yeah, I, I still do wiring and plumbing and, and things like that. Yeah, I do some of the same stuff. Yeah, I, I know you do. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm still pretty active about that. Well, you're my into cars as well. You yes, had, uh, I, I have a car kit car that I'm building. And uh, my wife is on the board of, of Opera San Jose, has been for 35 years. She was chairman of the board for three years or so. And, uh, uh, and I love opera and also jazz. So I've been on the board of San Jose Jazz since I retired, which is about 10 or 12 years ago. And I was president of the board for, or chairman of the board for three years or so. Well, that's coming up in uh, That's August. right. So too bad I can't, I'm not talking with, with a real audience here because in, in August we have the, one of the largest jazz festivals. Well, it's every August, so uh, yeah. if you happen to be watching this interview <laughs> next July, it, it's coming up. Yeah, in, 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 in August we have, uh, well, there's, there's 12 stages, more than 1,000 musicians, all different kinds of jazz, downtown San Jose. It's lots of fun. So, so we're, and we're active in the art museum and... and uh, I was, as you know, active in the Computer History Museum until I got my house projects. I hope to get back to that. <laughs> okay. And uh, you had cars, uh, you're building a kit car. You had Jaguars. Uh, we had I Jaguars. I, I, I now own a Tesla. And Oh, did you? Yeah. Okay, you've so, got into electric cars. And I have solar panels. I even have the batteries on the wall, so I'm, oh. I'm, doing, the whole, I'm doing the whole bit. <laughs> oh, okay, that's fantastic. <laughs> And, and I hope to finish my kit car, too. That's one of my... Anything else you'd like to add before we close up? No, I, it's, it's been interesting. I, I I'll tell you that uh, I, you probably noticed I refer, referred to some notes. And that's because as we were, as we, I knew this was coming up, I would wake up in the middle of the night for whatever reason. Think of stuff. And yeah. then I would start thinking of things. And I said, well, I better write that down. Me too. And then I started, and so pretty soon I had all these pages and so a couple of days ago, I sat down and said, let's, let's, let's write them down and put them together. And uh, it's particularly fun if you think, if you remember back, you know, I can remember back certain days in the lab when things were there and who, who the people were. And sometimes I can't remember all the names, but uh, I have all kinds of very fond memories. Oh, me too. And I think, uh, I think Bill, we've been fortunate that we worked around really smart, dedicated, creative people. And we're not, uh, uh, we're not immersed in a lot of the problems that people, I mean, we're not surrounded with homeless people in our lives. Although I have a homeless guy that I try to keep employed as much as I can. Uh, uh, we're, we're not in, in an industry where, it, uh, where stupid people live. I mean, so we really got people who were very smart and ambitious, and 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 want to contribute. And I feel I feel personally I've had a chance to contribute. I hope to contribute. I know that you do do too. So my friend, after many 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 years and five companies together. Yeah, forty years or so. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Mike, for your time and interest in oral histories uh, for the Computer History Museum. Um, I'm sure the visitors will find and learn from your experiences and. Uh, uh, have a good time doing it. 